in back channel dialogue and mediation, facilitating very difficult conversations, bringing people together, forming improbable relationships across divides. I think one thing recent, recent months has taught us, looking at Ukraine and Russia, is that we cannot be complacent. Um, I suppose peace is not a pinpoint in time or with the signing of an agreement. It is an ongoing process that we have to continue to work on together. So as I said, we are particularly honoured to partner with the NRS today. Um, and for the duration of this conference, I do hope that we can welcome uh, many of you to Glen Cree tomorrow to our beautiful site up in the Wicklow Mountains so you can engage in some of our dialogue sessions and enjoy the hospitality of my colleagues. Um, we are very honoured today uh, to have received a letter of welcome from the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. President Higgins is also the patron of Glen Cree. I'll read from his note. May I send my best wishes to all those participating in the 10th European Remembrance Symposium. The aim and theme of this symposium is a greatly important one. Reconciliation is a word that suggests so much and implies such a myriad of possibility. History has taught us the importance of not forgetting the past, but it has also taught us that we must do so in ways that do not darken the contemporary moment or deprive the future of hope and opportunity. It is only when we release ourselves from bitterness, revenge, or denunciation that we can move forward towards the light of new beginnings. May I thank, therefore, all those who will be examining, examining the steps that must be made on the journey of reconciliation. By helping us to navigate that complex journey, you also enable us to look at a, to a future founded on forgiveness and resolution. I wish you well as you gather in Dublin for the significant symposium and every little work. Michael D. Higgins, Uchtaron Naharan, President of Ireland. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Joe Costello, Deputy Lord Mayor of Dublin. Thanks very much, Neve, and um, Minister Thomas Byrne, my old parliamentary colleague, uh, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Gramila Mahogiv, Asak Dan Kora, Chak Ta Shaw, Don Okhaj, Special Ta Shaw, the Trinity College. I'm delighted to have the opportunity of coming here today on this special occasion of the 10th year of the European Remembrance Symposium, and particularly with its theme of reconciliation. And to that ex to the, in that area, then, I'm particularly delighted that the Glyn Cree Centre for Peace and Reconciliation with its long and distinguished role in peace building and reconciliation, is, is co-organizing the symposium with the European Network for Remembrance and Solid Solidarity, which itself is a platform for dialogue about difficult past traumatic memory. The purpose of this symposium is to discuss the meaning and role of reconciliation in the context of both historical and contemporary European and international conflicts. And I particularly like the description of reconciliation as a long and winding path. Well, that was up there a minute ago anyway. Um, and indeed, there are many twists and turns on that particular path. Each participant here brings unique perspectives, sensitivities, experiences, and interpretations. And by bringing together representatives of governments, culture, and academic institutions, and experts from non-governmental and public organizations from various parts of the world, the, this symposium is seeking to open up a discussion on the multifaceted issues of reconciliation among, the, among and within European nations. And Ireland, of course, is a case in point. The starting point for our discussion is the Irish experience of civil war. And this year, of course, marks the centenary of the outbreak of the Irish Civil War in 1922, which followed the War of Independence of 1919 to 1921. A country united in war against the colonial power in a common cause rapidly became a country hopelessly divided over the controversial terms of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 that brought that war to an end. A free state was formed, which became a republic in 1949. Nevertheless, bitterness and resentment 
were widespread, and a sullen silence descended after the traumatic events of the Civil War on the country. Many emigrated and harbored bitterness abroad, particularly in the United States, to add to the bitterness engendered by the Great Famine 70 years earlier. For young men, in many cases, surprisingly in Ireland, the national political rivalries were often transcended by sporting, traditional sporting rivalries, which pitted parish against parish and county against county. And in that way, political opponents often bonded through sport. That was the only pathway and the only form of reconciliation, while at the same time, the residue and the memory of divisive conflict continued to lurk beneath the surface. The more recent conflict in Northern Ireland was caused by a denial of civil rights that subsequently broadened into issues of Irish unity. For decades, the European Union and the United States have watched anxiously and offered substantial advice, goodwill and financial support to help resolve the conflict. The Good Friday Agreement which ended the violent conflict in Northern Ireland was a monumental act of political reconciliation and appeared to herald a definitive bright new era for the entire island of Ireland. However, the topic of personal reconciliation still remains unresolved for many and remains very relevant, particularly for the victims of the Troubles, and there remains a legacy issue there that has not been fully addressed to this day. Also new challenges and divisions have emerged through Brexit after the United Kingdom voted to leave the EU in 2020, and Northern Ireland voted to remain. The Unionist community is seeking reassurance and full UK integrity, and Minister Byrne knows all about this, full UK integrity for Northern Ireland, while the main nationalist party is seeking a border poll for national unity with the rest of Ireland. Consequently, there is no functioning government and the Good Friday Agreement is on hold. Peace certainly can't be taken for granted in the present standoff situation. Therefore, Dublin, I believe, is one of the most appropriate places to hold discussions devoted to reconciliation, as we are doing today, and hopefully many others can draw from our experience in this field. The topic of reconciliation after violent conflict is especially pertinent and important now since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It highlights a new and difficult context for the symposium debates on the history of reconciliation processes. Again, I believe that Dublin is a good place for these debates to start. The two organizing, organizations co-organizing the symposium, namely Glencree Centre and the European Network for uh, Remembrance and Solidarity, have a strong tradition in finding pathways to reconciliation and sustain peace to facilitated dialogue and shared learning. And I'm delighted that they are taking on this, this responsibility and this um, particular difficult uh, work at the present time. They have already begun that dialogue related to the experience of war and the creation of a new order. On May the 20th, this conversation was started by the launch of an excellent exhibition in Collins' Barracks entitled After the Great War, A New Europe, 1918-1923. That outdoor exhibition, a fantastic exhibition, shows how ordinary people in Central and Eastern Europe coped with the traumatic experience of the Great War and the following years in the period 1918 to 23. And if you haven't seen that exhibition, you should certainly try and do so over the next couple of weeks while it is still there. And finally, let me conclude by saying that we must not forget that the history of the 20th century and now the 21st century, that Europe is strewn with examples of extreme savagery. Yet there is absolute proof that the tide of inhumanity can be rolled back by, by the far more powerful tide of humanity. Thanks to reconciliation, 
to dialogue, to generosity, to kindness, and especially to courage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these moving words, uh, Mr. Deputy Lord Mayor. The best possibility to see the exhibition uh, in Collins Barracks, the exhibition after the Great War, will be today because it is a point in our program today before the, before the um, uh, evening reception. And now, I would like to ask uh, Thomas Born. Minister of State for European Affairs at the Department of Tishech and at the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland to give his speech. Gormagat, Asan Valcher, Chaklan Shohanyov, Gormagat, Alas, Ard Vera, Alclea, my former Rockless colleague, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor Joe Coslow, uh, the Diplomatic Corps. Great to see many familiar faces here today and everybody attending this uh, symposium today. Um, and it's a real honor to address the symposium. I like the word symposium because, of course, it comes from the Greek, meaning to maybe have a drink together after the discussions. So I wish you great discussions and perhaps you will have the opportunity to have maybe one, one beverage in, uh, somewhere in Dublin. But I think I mean that in the best possible way, that we can learn from each other, we can talk, we can relax um, after doing what I think is really, really important work uh, that you're doing here. I'm really glad to be back in Trinity, uh, where I spent many happy years coming in and out of this particular room. Uh, in fact, my first day in university was, was the, the orientation was in this room, so and I remember very well. Unfortunately, it gets longer and longer ago, um, but it's great to be here. Um, I want to commend the European Network for Remembrance of Solidarity and, of course, Glen Cree for convening the symposium. It's going to be a really, really important uh, few days. Uh, in my role as Minister for European Affairs, I often like to stress that democracy is complex and indeed history uh, is complex too. And Trinity College itself is an example of our complex history. Uh, historically, Trinity was the university of the Protestant ascendancy in Ireland and there were restrictions on Catholics coming to this university. Um, but even a for 100 years after Catholics were allowed to come here, the Catholic Church itself put restrictions on Catholics uh, to come to the university unless they received uh, a special dispensation. So, so those rules and restrictions and uh, inequality and division, uh, that feels almost unimaginable today, of course, uh, against what you see outside is a the backdrop of a di diverse and vibrant university, which we're all gathered in today. So history is complex. We can't change it. But we learn from it, and we let it inform our decisions of today. And we don't dwell on it either, except to learn from it. Uh, on this island, of course, we now have a whole generation that was born and has grown to adulthood since the Good Friday Agreement, which brought Northern Ireland out of the shadow of violence. We can't forget, of course, that three, over 3,500 people died in the violence in Northern Ireland. Each of those lost lives leaves behind a grieving family. His suffering was immense, and they left behind communities which remain deeply impacted today. The violence in Northern Ireland etched the geography of tragedy into our collective consciousness. We mentioned Bally Murphy, Kings Mill, Dublin and Monaghan, Birmingham, and two that I particularly remember, Enniskillen and Oma, and they evoke memories of the darkest days. And it's very hard to get, even for me, in terms of Enniskillen and Oma, which are two that are in my memory. I was 10 when Enniskillen happened. I remember watching the TV on the Sunday morning when, when it came up. And Oma then, I was, I was interrailing actually when the news came through. I was very angry. And it's hard, to, it's hard sometimes to, to let that go as well, like in, in terms of those memories uh, that we have. And more, more, more difficult, of course, for those who are directly impacted. I'm, I'm, I'm simply a bystander uh, on the island. So it's difficult but important that we remember the dreadful effect of Northern Ireland's violence. And we must not shy away from difficult conversations. Every family bereaved must have access to an effective investigation, to a process of justice, regardless of the perpetrator. This has been and remains a consistent position of the Irish government. We also know that true reconciliation can only be the product of agreement, of trust, and of difficult compromises. Indeed, it was the peace campaigner whose daughter um, who suffered, his family suffered at Enniskill, and Gordon Wilson, he was appointed to the Irish Senate then. But he said the compromise is not giving in at his maturity. So reconciliation is a slow process. It requires generosity of spirit, a commitment to, challenging, to the challenging work of building a new and better future together. It needs patient and dedicated support at all levels. 
The Government of Ireland has a reconciliation fund, and it's a, tangi it's a tangible expression of the continued commitment that we have, which is rooted in the core values of the Good Friday Agreement, to support the vital work of reconciliation on the island. Through our fund and in all of our actions in Northern Ireland, the Government seeks to live up to the challenge that John Hume laid down, that great peacemaker. He said there are fine words in the Good Friday Agreement about tolerance, mutual respect and reconciliation. We must strive to ensure that they become the touchstones by which we live. We put those words into action, is what John Hume was telling us. Ireland, along with our European partners, knows that reconciliation across Europe and the wider world is vital to our collective peace and security. Of course, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the Deputy Lord uh, Mayor referred to our civil war, but of course Europeans in general, and Ireland was affected too, found ourselves entrenched in, in war, literally entrenched in war, as the Great War gripped the continent from 1910 to 19, 1914 to 1918. Uh, today, in contrast, Europeans from nearly all of those countries are joined together in a shared union built on values. And I want to thank the diplomatic core of, the Europe, of, of all, all embassies, really, but particularly uh, of, of our European Union friends for their, for their work, uh, um, particularly with Len Cree, but just generally for reconciliation on this island. And I also want to thank as well their colleagues in London uh, who also do um, great work in Northern Ireland and work in reconciliation. I thank them very much, not just for their work, but the genuine interest that they have uh, in that work as well. United in diversity is, is our motto at the European Council. Um, the Council brings together diverse voices, but out of that diversity, unity can emerge as member states take unified action in the interest of collective peace and security. The exhibition, the, after the Great War in New Europe, 1918 to 1923, prepared by ENRS and co-funded by the European Union, is currently on exhibition at the National Museum of Ireland at Collins Barracks. The exhibition, and, and you're going there, the exhibition provides a valuable insight into the scale of the political changes brought about by war and the impact on current politics. Um, in Ireland, Deputy um, Lord Mayor Coslo just, just spoke about the impact that that kind of still has today, actually. It's not just as uh, divided as, as even it was in 2007. When I was first elected, I can really relate to the, 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 the civil war divisions that were still there, joined together by sport. I mean, I certainly know people in that camp. Now, that's even 15 years later, that's, that has changed significantly, I think, but it's, it's still there in our collective consciousness. So our experience informs our approach to reconciliation. Uh, I want to mention women as well and the transformative effect that women have had on, on peace in Northern Ireland, uh, both in negotiating the political settlement and continuing the work. Um, women have been very important in, in civil society and politics. Mary McAleese is the Chancellor of this university as well. She's had a powerful contribution to uh, the development of peace uh, on the island too. We support an inclusive approach to peace and to reconciliation. Um, we're strongly committed also to supporting peace and reconciliation and stability throughout the Western Balkans, really committed there. Uh, the memories of those conflicts which marked the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, again for me as a teenager, that's a, that's a memory from the news every single evening, uh, they're painfully fresh in minds and they must inspire us to work harder to promote reconciliation in this real vital area of our continent. We see today regrettably um, the illegal war in Ukraine. Uh, it's having dire humanitarian consequences, not least in Ukraine, but actually all over the world as well. Uh, Ukraine is on the front lines of resisting appalling and illegal military aggression from Russia, and the rest of Europe is remaining unwavering in support. Of course, we can't uh, forget the victims of conflicts in history, but we mustn't turn away either from those who need support and solidarity now. But it's vital to discuss ideas of reconciliation and how to remember the past, and the teaching of history being so important to our remembrance of the past, and um, uh, that, that is of particular interest, I know, to the teacher here today, uh, teaching as a history teacher himself, but unfortunately he can't be here um, today because he's in the doll uh, as we speak and he sends his apologies. Reconciliation, as the theme is, is, it definitely takes a long and winding path, but it's a journey that's well worth traveling. Together we can learn to reconcile differences, we can learn to live with difference and celebrate it. In recognizing that important endeavor, may I take this opportunity to thank you for attending the symposium, for your research and for your contribution to these vital issues. My continued best wishes to each and every one of you, and I've visited some of your institutions uh, and, and some of your, I suppose, memorials. Um, the, the work that you're doing is really, really incredibly important. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. And unfortunately, I have parliamentary business myself, so I won't be able to remain for the symposium. But uh, I really do wish you every success with this. And anything we can do as a government to promote your institutions to work with you um, and our embassies abroad certainly are involved with some of you 
and indeed with Glen Cree we're heavily involved. Um, we, we're only willing to do that because we, we know uh, the importance of it. So, Gurra Mila Mahavad. Thank you, Minister Byrne, for those uh, heartfelt and thought-provoking words. Um, your, your genuine public service ethic is truly remarkable, and we really do appreciate your support for both this symposium and the ongoing work of Glencree. Um, now, it's my pleasure to invite Anna Gallego Torres, Director General of the DG Justice and Consumers European Commission, to the podium. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you at the European Remembrance Symposium. I wish I could be there with you in beautiful Dublin to share my views in person, but unfortunately this time it was impossible due to other commitments. However, I didn't want to miss the chance to address you a few words in this meaningful event. I am recording these words in Madrid, the home to one of the most powerful paintings of the 20th century, the Picasso's Guernica which hangs on the walls of Reina Sofia Museum of Modern Art. The painting, which is of course stunning, has always been a good reminder to all of us in Spain of the tragedy of the Spanish Civil War and the devastating consequences for the population. But most importantly, it was a reminder that peace is never a given. The Guernica helps us to remember how divided our country once was. For so many people, it is an essential part of remembrance and necessary for reconciling their feelings of tragedy with the feeling of hope. This is beautifully described in the expression, never again. This is why the Commission has put in place programs to support the creative sector. For example, the European platform that has essentially digitized cultural collections from all over Europe. But as you will discuss over the next three days, there are so many different ways to reconciliation. In the Commission, reconciliation is a topic which is looked at by many departments and is part of so many different aspects of our work, from education to culture, research and justice, the portfolio I am charged with. But there are certain practices that we know really work. And one of these good practices is the creation of networks, such as the European Network for Remembrance and Solidarity. We are all aware of the importance of your work. You are helping to promote the study of our common history and our collective European memory. I am happy that we can support eight networks with 1.7 million euro per year. This pursuit of truth in remembrance, which your network does, is also so important for keeping your, our values intact. As historian Timothy Snyder recently wrote, the war on history is a war on democracy. This is such a striking and emotional phrase when you think about how the memory of the 20th century and specifically World War II and the Holocaust have been exploited for political gains, polarization, hatred. It is why the Commission has doubled the funding available to support European memory projects. There are 8 million euro available this year alone. There will be 10 million for next year and 12 million for the year after. This will mean that we can also cover projects looking at some of the topics that you will be discussing during the conference, including totalitarian regimes and colonialism. I, of course, invite you to watch out for the opening of the next call for proposals and please apply. Today, historical distortion is being used right before our eyes by Russia to justify the war in Ukraine. In this context and with the collective experience we all have, we must enable and support truth-seeking research, efforts for reconciliation and transnational history for memory. As we do within the European Union with our own projects, I hope we can find ways to support Ukraine too, whether it is part of our direct financial support or through our funding of NGOs and civil society. It is so important for Ukraine's legacy. But again, it requires active determination and political intervention to prioritize reconciliation. When Picasso was commissioned to do a painting for the Universal Exhibition back in 1937 in Paris, he chose to depict the horrors of the bombing of a Spanish village, Guernica, during the Civil War. It soon became the symbol of a country's determination not to forget its past. When the time comes, I hope we can help the people of Ukraine to do the same. Thank you very much.
And now to conclude the introductory speeches, I'd like to welcome back to the podium Rafael Roguski. Thank you, Niamh. Deputy Lord Mayor, Honorable Minister, being on the way, Your Excellences, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, forgiveness requires recognition of guilt and a form of compensation, at least a symbolic one. A reconciliation, though in many respects similar to forgiveness, does not necessarily include it. Instead, it requires consent to coexist with a feeling of mutual harm. The state, this state, is accepted in the name of peace, in the name of putting an end to the spiral of violence, and in the name of the victims who suffered. The decision to enter into the reconciliation process is also made with people on both sides in mind who, thanks to the peace achieved, have a chance not to become victims, to live and build a community against all the odds. After, at the heart of reconciliation is a deeply human, natural art not to be afraid, afraid for our loved ones, ourselves, and our homeland. Reconciliation requires consent that peace is more important than fighting and country. Therefore, each part in the conflict needs humility and to be reflective, must find the strength to give up the fight, give up the desire to win, and above all, give up the desire to revenge. In the next three days, during the 10th European Remembrance Symposium, we will be considering different aspects of reconciliation in the context of both historical and contemporary European internal and international conflicts. We will learn, we will learn from the witnesses of reconciliation, compare different definitions and approaches to reconciliation, and we will discuss the social and political actors who have had the greatest influence on the course of state reconciliation processes in the past. We will also take a closer look at the role of art and artists and explore the question why the reconciliation processes take so long and why are they so fragile. Our debate about reconciliation is part of the larger project, the European Remembrance Symposium. The aim of the event is to each year consider different aspects of the European culture and cultures of remembrance. But even more importantly, we see the symposium as a chance for you. Our guests, academics, researchers, and culture managers to meet and through meaningful discussions, influence each other. During panel discussions, networking sessions, and backstage conversations, we will exchange knowledge and ideas. Sometimes we will also express doubts and confront differing perspectives. We will present the result of our projects, share our achievements, establish new contacts and possible partnerships. Hopefully, we will learn and inspire one another. Our meeting with its ambitious goals would not be possible without the contribution of a number of key people and institutions. First of all, let me thank the team of European Network Remembrance and Solidarity and Glen Cree Center for Peace and Reconciliation co-organizers of the 10th European Remembrance Symposium. I would also like to express my gratitude uh, to the partners of this year's edition of the symposium. And those were and are Felte Island, the Federal Institute for Culture and History of the Germans in Eastern Europe, 
the Embassy of Republic of Poland in Dublin, the Slovak Nations Memory Institute in Bratislava, the Embassy of Slovak Republic in Dublin, the Embassy of Federal Republic of Germany in Dublin, and the Embassy of Hungary in Dublin. And of course, the Embassy of Romania in Dublin. Thank you very much for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, today in Poland, and probably in some other countries in Europe, is an International Children's Day. This is probably the best frame to discuss about the reconciliation. To all of you gathered here in Trinity College and to all online participants, I wish you a fruitful meeting. Welcome to the 10th European Remembrance Symposium and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Director. And now we will start uh, right now with the first opening session of the, um, of the symposium. So I would like all the panelists to come on the stage, uh, as well with the moderator, because we'll, we are going to start right now. as to why we, we're going to do the first session slightly differently. Um, and um, generally then I'm going to introduce both our guests who are here and our uh, online guest, Professor uh, Monica Williams. Um, I, th I think I'd like to start by echoing what uh, Deputy Lord Mayor Joe Costello and Thomas Byrne said about the appropriateness of Dublin and Ireland generally to host reconciliation. I think... Um, one of the things I learned in school that we were to be very proud of uh, the first time our governments changed power in the early 1930s and it was done so uh, without uh, bullets or guns and that's always just a historically important moment of transition uh, in, in our Irish history which we, we remember very well. In, in terms of just saying, um, and obviously I, I want to echo uh, the immediacy and the tragedy of what's going on in Ukraine and indeed uh, the fact that hopefully during these sessions we will uh, develop some ideas about how we can respond to the reconciliation that undoubtedly will be very hard for uh, Ukrainians and Russians to engage in when this horror finally ends. I just want to say just a, a little minute about why it means so much to me to have been invited here today by uh, the Glen Cree and ENRS. And it's because I have, uh, my, own, my, my life has more or less been totally interested in uh, the process of transition to democracy in Eastern Europe. And I was lucky enough to be in Gdansk in 1980 in the shipyard, brought there by my friend, uh, the late Jan Latinsky, uh, Polish dissident, and to witness the birth of solidarity there. Later, I spent uh, about three months over the period of uh, the roundtable talks in Poland, particularly in June 1989. And I've been trying to understand, you know, how that massive change, the regime change, how the roundtable itself actually could happen and how Poland would develop uh, arising and resulting uh, out of that deal. And I suppose implicit in that deal is one of the central themes of um, what this organization, uh, ENRS, is all about, and Glen Cree. And it is, of course, you know, the, 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 the idea of reconciliation, but most importantly, implicit in the round table deal in Poland was, of course, drawing a line uh, with the past. And that is quite controversial. I think about, the, what, to, from my perspective, the wisdom of those who advised to draw this thick red line. I think about it almost uh, every day. 
Um, and certainly it is something that I haven't yet come up in my head with a, a definitive uh, answer on. Um, so that's why I'm interested and delighted to be here today, and thanks again to the organisers for asking me to come here. I said I wanted to say something about uh, logistics and uh, how we're going to operate this session. Uh, Dublin Airport is in a, a bit of a dog's dinner at the moment, and I am very concerned that uh, uh, Professor Shavinsky, um, he has arrived safely, we want to let him depart safely as well. So rather than introduce all of our guests and, and, and uh, speakers and invite them to, 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 to speak sequentially, I'm in fact going to ask uh, in a moment Professor uh, Shavinsky to speak, and then we'll take some questions, and then we'll roll into the normal panel. And it is purely to ensure that he does not go away with a very, very bad PR experience of Dublin hospitality. So we're anxious that he can come and go. So first, so our first speaker today is uh, Professor uh, Piotr Szewinski. He's a medieval historian, but as he said uh, to me when we spoke outside, he sort of got sidetracked, um, happily I think so. Uh, he's been the director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum since 2006. He's of very actively involved in uh, Polish Jewish and Christian Jewish uh, dialogues. Um, he's a uh, founder of the co founder of the Birkenau uh, Auschwitz Institute, and he is a, a, a hugely renowned expert at the Centre for Research on uh, the Economics of Memorial Sites. Um, he's also a co founder of a number of important organisations in the area of uh, reconcili uh, reconciliation. He's written widely, of course, in medieval history, but I also just want to m remember today the fact that um, Piotr's father, uh, Bodan, received the Lech Wałęsa Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the Underground uh, Solidarity in 1983. And I understand your father is still with us, and well, so happy, happy days to him. I. Uh, I, 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 I suppose the other thing I'd like to remember is that he's, a, he's the co-founder of the Flying University, which is education is always key to reconciliation. So, um, could I ask you uh, to, to take the floor now, uh, Dr. Shavinsky, and to uh, give us your uh, contribution? I, I think you're going to talk about reconciliation in the context of the round table. So I'll sit down for now. One, two, three. Yeah. It's functioning, yeah. Yeah, I would like to... To thanks for, uh, yes, in the beginning, uh, the organizers of, of, of this meeting. And I'm sorry that I've got to fly back, but uh, tomorrow morning I, I must be in Auschwitz, uh, so, so, so I, I, I can stay longer. Uh, and I would like to give some remarks about the reconciliation in Poland after the communism uh, time. Mm. Yes, because in Poland, especially, we were in a situation when uh, reconciliation after 89 was in fact a, a reason of state. There was no other possibilities because of our history, or because of our borders, because of, of the reality. We never got some serious problem, let's say, since centuries in the north-south axis, when the east-west axis was completely changing, let's say, in all generations, borders were changing, everything were changing. Uh, so, uh, those who created, let's say, the new free democratic Poland were absolutely persuaded that the reconciliation is one of the, of the most important reasons of state uh, of Poland. But before we are thinking uh, in the external uh, approach, in the internal also, there were some tensions between, uh, of course, uh, post communist and the democratic post dissidents. Uh, and uh, all the internal, let's say, crisis would be in the early 90s uh, very easily uh, used by the uh, by the Russia uh, by, by the Russian infiltration we have to remember that in the beginning of the 90s uh, the Russian army were still uh, in Poland and not, not, not everything was uh, let's say resolved uh, very very quickly uh, and uh, and if the majority agrees with, uh, with this perspective that the reconciliation inside Poland is, uh, is a deep need, of course there were a minority who were strongly against, who were uh, thinking that uh, persecution and penalization and uh, some judgment of, of post-communists is something that we really need in order to, 
to, to obtain a tabula rasa of a moral, let's say, point of view of the country. And those, those discussions were very, very strong in the 90s, I think until the election of uh, Alexander Kwasniewski, a Polish president, coming from the post-communist, uh, uh, let's say, society. This shows that the, the entire society do not really think that this axis post-communist or post-dissident is the most important for the future of the Poland. It was a surprise for many, for many people, the, those elections, I think. Mm. And, uh, but in fact, uh, it took, uh, let's say, 15 years, maybe, uh, maybe even more, uh, in order to, to have some, some concrete, let's say, results of this internal reconciliation. Even today, in our politics time, there are sometimes some very, very strong voices that are referring to this uh, to this initial, let's say, uh, decision to, 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 to build a new Poland through, through reconciliation. Uh, but in an external way, it was certainly most interesting. As I told, it was concerning more the east-west, let's say, uh, axis. Germany, of course, was our most important partner, a Germany that was reconciliating herself, let's say, at that time uh, between the East and the West. That was also certainly not easy. Uh, but for us, for Poland, Germany was considered as an uh, entrance door to the North Atlantic uh, Pact and the entrance door to the European Union. And this was the only possible, let's say, evolution for a democratic and, uh, and, and free Poland at that time. Uh, so I must tell you that it's very hard to imagine how the starting point was strongly difficult at that time. Uh, when I've got, I don't know, seven, eight or nine years old and I was in school, there were no more, let's say, terrific insult that to be, to be treated as German between, between kids. When I, uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I give this, 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 when I testify that to my kids in the 2000s, they didn't think how it was possible, where we were living, what time it was, how it's possible. You know, it showed, let's say, from one generation to the others, the enormous way that was done. It was not, uh, of course, uh, a, a path that was uh, created uh, by itself, but uh, there was an incredible number of exchanges in the 90s and early 2000s. They were, they were supported by, uh, by governments, by local society, by, by different organizations. Exchanges of, uh, of schools, or of youth movement, or associations, or for the business is normal maybe. Uh, and I think that this very, very deep program of, of very concrete meetings between very concrete people uh, was something that changed completely, uh, completely this perspective, but it took also 10 or 15 years. It's very important if we are thinking on the reconciliation from the political point of view. 15 years, it, it means that it's, it's, it's a longer period that one party or one majority uh, can, can be at the power in general. Uh, that means uh, this reconciliation must be a, a pluripolitical, let's say, choice. Uh, on the other side, on the east, uh, we've got the, some new countries, sometimes with a very old uh, history, but, uh, but new countries in, in this post-Soviet time, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania. Uh, and uh, those countries, I think all the three, have got some very diverse way to, let's say, define, to, to, to find their identity after the collapse of the Soviet system. And to be clear, some historical issues were playing a quite important, let's say, role uh, between Poland and Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine, certainly. With Belarus, it was more difficult because it's, it was very quickly hard to, to, to speak about the free country. Mm, uh, however, uh, however uh, some of those... Uh, historical uh, difficulties uh, was in opposition to, 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 to Free Poland with sometimes a, a very clear help of, of some Russian propaganda, of course, or, or some influences. But some issues from the time of the Second World War or uh, even, 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 even from past centuries were, were raised in, in many different discussions and it was something that 
still I think needs some uh, some very good monograph to to, to, to be analyzed uh, e even the sources of those of those of those voices also uh, and in that situation uh, yes there were all, also some exchanges of, of, of youth people at a smaller scale than than, than in, it was with Germany it was more uh, due to some uh, local authorities some uh, some some NGOs some some uh, some schools let's say uh, some individuals also but i think yes it, it it permitted us to to know again as better like it was probably before before the war uh, and uh, and for example with ukraine what's helped a lot that since 10 or, or 12 years we, we have more than 1 million uh, I, I am speaking before the war, huh? more than one million of Ukrainians living in Poland, so, so, so Ukrainians in our perceptions are, are let's say, a very approached population, very well understood, very, uh, from the cultural uh, point of view, from, from different point of view, uh, some, so, so, some very approached, let's say, society. That's why now to, to, to have three millions of Ukrainians, it, it, it was not, not a question, let's say, how to do that, it was, it was normal like with uh, some cousins or some, yeah. Uh, this story in the East is certainly not finished, uh, as we know. Uh, we will see what, what will be in the future, but, but certainly the, the presence of a, of a common enemy uh, helped to feel stronger with, with the societies. And there was another very important dialogue that was I was involved inside. It was the, the dialogue with the Jewish diaspora in Israel, uh, with the dominant, of, of course, uh, role uh, of, the, of the experience of the Holocaust, um, understood as a history of perpetrators, of course, bystanders in the large point of view, and uh, some helpers. So a very perplex uh, history that cannot be uh, really explained in one, two, or three sentences. Uh, but, uh, but the beginning was very, very difficult because the story of the Holocaust was during two generations told on trust me, by the survivors in the diaspora in Israel. And the, especially after 68, there were not really sufficiently uh, of Jews in Poland in order to participate if, in even some dialogues about, about, about the Holocaust. So, so the story of the camps was more translate, transmis, uh, transmitted by, by, uh, by Polish political survivors. And in Auschwitz it was very, very interesting because um, we have one place that was uh, this is a place of a terrible story of the European Jews, but it was also a terrible story for 150,000 Polish people. Uh, and the both part of this, uh, let's say, history didn't discuss at all during two generations after the war. And after 89, they were coming back in the same place, and they did not recognize the two narratives. It was something very, very special. In the 90s, there was a lot of crisis on, uh, uh, on this story uh, in Auschwitz, or around Auschwitz. But in fact, also in this situation, uh, some natural contact, some meeting of young people, uh, it took 15 maybe years, to 15 years to, 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 let's say, find some mutual understanding of this, uh, of, of this history uh, to, to be achieved. Uh, a very, very important role played uh, some common meetings or trainings uh, of educators. Since, I don't know, maybe 20 years or more, uh, guides from Auschwitz were going uh, to, to Yad Vashem to be trained during one week. Uh, since the same time, the educators from Yad Vashem were coming to Auschwitz to be trained. And slow by slow, let's say, a common vision of this very complex story were, uh, were built uh, in this Auschwitz perspective, but it took also 10 to 15 years. And why, why I am uh, insisting so much on those period? Yes, because during conflicts, and let me finish by this remark, during conflicts, governments or, or politicians have a direct influence on information or on propaganda. It's normal. 
information and propaganda during conflict is, 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 a, is a very serious, maybe the most important serious tool that they have. But after the conflict, when we are starting to speak about reconciliation, it's certainly not government or politicians that has to do the most important job. Why? Because the remembrance, the, the main difference between the information or a propaganda in conflict's time and a remembrance is that remembrance is a polyphonic voice. Uh, so we never have, I never participated in any axis of reconciliation when there were two parts. On the both side, there were many, many different sub-parts uh, in this process of reconciliation, and this is something I think extremely important because it shows us that without uh, non-governmental organization, with, without local society, we, without different, uh, let's say, people, concrete people, not as actors, but as creators, let's say, let's say uh, of this reconciliation, uh, it will never function and it will never uh, receive a potential of a concrete and continued work for 10, 15 or, or, or 20 years. And I'm really sorry that I will be obliged to, 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 to leave. Thanks very much. Uh, is this one working, folks, or do I need to turn it on? Oh, right, that's good. I'll take this one. Um, in, first of all, does anyone have a question for Dr. Shavinsky? Okay, could I ask you then to say a little bit more about this notion of the polyphonic voices um, and the period of remembrance as opposed to the, the pre-period where you talked about sort of the control of information uh, because that's a dangerous period for, for any process is when the narrative is not controlled. So could you just develop that point for us a little bit? Thank you. Uh, not very clear, let's say during a conflict Let's say there is something like a gestion of conflict, and uh, everybody who who is governing, let's say, a conflict, need uh, need, need a clear propaganda. Uh, look what's going on in in the first weeks in in, uh, in the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine. They were so close to thinking that it will take three or four days until the collapse of, uh, of Ukraine, that they even did not prepare any symbols for the army. The Z was used by the soldiers because they didn't receive any symbol. And a symbol is something extremely important because the soldier will not know, let's say, an entire politological explanation. Uh, he needs a symbol to die for. And they didn't receive this symbol, so, so they took this Z uh, or some other uh, inscriptions on the tanks uh, as, let's say, yes, uh, a sign for, for, for their victory. Uh, so, so during the conflict, those persons, those uh, governments who are, who are involved in conflicts, of course, prepare uh, a very clear, a very simple, if not simplest, uh, explanation to the large public. But everybody in the society is living this conflict in a different way because of family's tradition, because of geographical position, because of uh, uh, historical evolution of this conflict in this uh, concrete situation and, and after we are in presence of really a polyphony of voice. Uh, uh, the conflict in Ukraine will be certainly uh, differently, let's say, uh, uh, the perception will be different in the western part of Ukraine than in this eastern part, completely destructed, and the most approach by culture or by language to the Russian uh, community. So, 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 so in every conflict, when, when we are speaking about reconciliation, we must take uh, account that even in the other side, we are in place of different experiences. If one day we would like to have a reconciliation with Russia, I don't know in how many years it will be possible, we will speak, of course, with some officials, if they will be able to, 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 to discuss with us. But we'll also speak with people from the Memorial Association because if there's a, a hope, let's say, in this, it is in this part of the, of, of the Russian society. And those are completely two different worlds, uh, but they will the both probably be engaged in, in, a, in a form of, of dialogue or reconciliation. Thank you. 
Could I ask you a little, given your, your particular expertise um, and your uh, professional academic expertise, um, clearly uh, the past is such a contested space in, in, in Poland um, and in other parts of East Central Europe. Um, from your perspective, um, do, do you see that contestation as being in a worse place or a better place than, say, it was in the early 1990s? I suppose I'm trying to gauge um, the, the path of uh, institutionalization of norms in politics. In you know, it, it, it depends. If the past is con contested, if the past is discussed, that means that the past is alive. And taking uh, in consideration Auschwitz, yes, I'm happy that it's still alive. The remembrance is alive. It's not something dead like uh, the bottle of, uh, I don't know, uh, Marignan in uh, 1515, if I remember. Uh, it's still speaking something to us. And we see how many uh, the journalists, the politicians, the educators are referring to that path, observing what's going on in, in Ukraine. That means it is a very clear referring point. Very, very clear. I, I even did not imagine three months ago that Auschwitz, the Holocaust, the tragedy of the camps can be a referring point at that level. Mm. For me, the past, and I'm speaking as a historian, it's not something that I have to study in order to judge the past. Mm. It's a key for the understanding of today and a key for planning the future. So, so if it's still contested, discussed, analyzed, uh, that means we are still uh, facing a, a, a live uh, remembrance. And it's, it's, it's crucial, especially on those topics like, uh, like Auschwitz on the Holocaust. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, I'll give you the mic. We can, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for giving me the floor to have the first question. <laughs> In this symposium. My name is Nikos Kosmidis and I'm coming from Greece. Um, Mr. Director, for uh, your remark about the lack of symbols, I would, I would disagree. I would say uh, the fact that there was this instrumentalization of anti-fascism from the side of Russia, but also from the side of uh, the rest of the European family. Both sides used fascism and anti-fascism as a tool to speak about the context right now in Ukraine and the war. How do you feel about it? For me, this is an abuse of memory, an abuse of history, and abuse of reconciliation, and somehow we have to address that. So the symbol was there, but it was an abusive symbol, in my opinion. Thank you. Of course, in the propaganda, in the Russian narrative, uh, they're referring uh, to... to uh, so-called Nazi Ukraine uh, is, is omnipresent, but I would like to, to make one remark. Russians, for the first time in the story of the post-war Soviet Union or Russia, are not speaking about fascism. They are speaking about Nazi. It's, some, it's a neology for them. During decades, they were attacking the fascists. And now, because they have some paramilitary formations that are clearly fascists, that are uh, defining themselves as fascists. Some ideologues close to Putin say that there are bad fascists and good fascists, for example. They were obliged to use a new terminology that they never used before, that is a Occidental, uh, a Western uh, terminology, Nazi, in the first time. Uh, of course, it's, 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 a, it's an awful, let's say, uh, attack and, uh, and something absolutely inadmissible. Uh, but, however, even in this symbol, they were obliged to, to, to find something else in order to not make in a difficult position their own fascists. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Emil Suljagic. I'm the director of the Srebrenica Memorial Center, and I actually wish I could ask you this question um, privately, but obviously you're going to leave. Now, I'd really like you to... I, I'm somewhat concerned about this idea of polyphony in establishing a narrative of what happened. Uh, obviously, I would agree with you if, if what you mean is that we should... If, if, that we should accept the historical narrative, that we should work on the historical narrative, because it's richer than the judicial narrative 
and for the most part, you know, societies go for the judicial narrative, you know, who's guilty, who's victim. And, and I think that, but what concerns me there, and, and I don't know if I understood you properly, is that you're saying that we should have a conversation with perpetrators of atrocities or not, or include them, or to what degree. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to put you on the, on, the, on the spotlight here. I just need, need to understand that because, you know, you're heading a very important institution. And I, want, I, I just wanted you to clarify that point. But it, it, it's a most crucial question, in fact. Uh, it, it depends on the situation. Sometimes I know some situation where there was a clear dialogue with perpetrators, or let's say their, let's say, uh, organizations or their, their parties, and sometimes, in some times, of course, uh, it, it was a dialogue without them. Uh, there, there are really different situations. How you can imagine, let's say, a, a dialogue uh, inside Rwanda only among the Tutsis? Uh, of course, 30,000 or 40,000 of the direct perpetrators were, were put in prisons. But, however, uh, let's say it was, let's say, a pressure of, of a larger uh, public. Uh, what happened in, in 94? So sometimes you must you must define your, your priorities if you want to save something in common, or if you want to continue to to fight until the final victory. That means the destruction of the other parts, and uh, there are. There are probably tens of different levels uh, between those two, those two uh, approaches, as well as I observed in different places, like in, in Cambodia, for example, another very good example, very good example, or in the early post-Soviet Russian times, when some of, the, of people who spent 10, 15 years in gulags were participating in the in some way to, to, to recreate some, some Russia that would be, in their vision, let's say a democratic one, uh, uh, open to citizens, uh, to open to, 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 to everybody. Uh, what happens, we, we know. But, but, you know, in a, in a dialogue, it, it's, let's say, in a dialogue, you are every time in a very, very difficult position because you will be attacked by some of those that you think you, you need to dialogue with them, and you will be attacked also by yours. Uh, that, that I'm familiar yeah. with, thank you. Everybody who tried that know that very, very well. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Um, Im implicit in some of the things you were talking about there was um, sort of time and time passing. Um, in terms of sort of reconciliation processes. Uh, two questions. One, the role of individuals and the relationships between them. How important do you think is that in terms of uh, reconciliation? And indeed, um, how important do you think is timing in, in reconciliation? I think, you know, reconciliation, we are speaking not only about political act, but we are speaking about uh, personal uh, remembrance, about personal emotions. So, so for individuals, let's say, without individuals, politi political acts are just symbols that could be commented, discussed, maybe not every time well understood. Uh, I, I think the, let's say, the main function of of countries, of government, is to help concrete people to, to make their own reconciliation. That's why I, I was speaking about this example between Germany and Poland. Those, I don't know, not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who, who, who met really very, in a very concrete way uh, together in the 90s or early 2000s. And, and it, slow by slow it changed, let's say, the, the, the perspective, not from the political point of view, because this you can change. Uh, one, in one day or two days, but, but really in the deep in the society. It was something very, very crucial. Uh, but in another way, uh, in another way, without a help of, uh, of governments or politicians, uh, doing that only in the, let's say, open society, it, it's certainly not enough. That's, that's why I was speaking, I was trying to show that in those cases that I know it took 15, 20, 25 years, because there must be a agreement over different parties that will change three times during that time or four times that yes this is uh, uh, the direction that you would like to try to do 
independently of that, if you are the Prime Minister or if I am Prime Minister. And this can change, but this is a, the reason of the state and we have to continue in that way. So the both are extremely important. Let's say the one without the other, uh, we will not be functioning very well. Yeah, I think, I think this one's working. Just before you go, um, you talked about exchanges. Uh, in other words, I, I presume you meant youth exchanges. And, well, yeah. and so that brings in education. Um, how, how, how important is that? And I'm, I'm taking on board that you're talking about it has to be not just political actors, it has to be you know, societal uh, groups, it has to be NGOs, etc. But education. I don't think education is the most important. Uh, you know, it's like during conferences. What is said during conferences is extremely important, but the most important is on the corridors, uh, in the evening and in the hotels and uh, during the breakfast. Uh, we know that all, everybody. Uh, so I think with education, it's the same. Education is books, teachers, schools. But the most important is the individual experience of the other. That's why an exchange, when we are going, when a, when a, when a teenager is going for one week uh, or, or 10 days to, 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 to a German family, they are living together, they are, uh, you know, it's, it's not the education that will change that. Uh, you need, uh, especially after a trauma, a social trauma, a common trauma, uh, a conflict, uh, you, you need, you need a, a good experience of, of the other. So, so that's why an exchange is certainly more important than an education. However, of course, if there are teachers among us, excuse me, <laughs> changing the books uh, uh, is also relatively important, yes, of course. I I'm actually, sorry. I'm, you I'm have to go. I, I actually, I did mean education in a broader sense, but can we thank you uh, in the usual way for your contribution? Um, good luck and goodbye, and I, ho I hope Dublin Airport is kind to you, Professor. Um, kinder than it was to all the people last Sunday, in any case. Um, it is um, now my great pleasure to um, introduce to you um, Monica McWilliams. Um, I should, I'm just going to jump over here for a minute, because I just want to bring something with me. Um, I should say that Monica is, well, for, for, firstly, for me, she's an icon. She is somebody that um, anyone with a literally passing knowledge of the peace process in Northern Ireland, uh, she stands out for a number of reasons, but of course, because she's a woman. Uh, and as she notes um, in her book, uh, and indeed in other of her utterances, uh, it was that there were other women involved, but women tend to get written out of the histories. She co-founded uh, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition in 96. She was elected to the multi-party uh, peace negotiations. She was a signatory to the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. She served on the first Northern Ireland Legislative Assembly until 2003, and she was subsequently Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission. She was also appointed um, as a Commissioner of the Independent Reporting Commission for the Disbandment of Parliamentary Organisations in 2017. And really importantly, um, Monica is now working with Syrian women involved in uh, the negotiations in Geneva. Um, her memoir, uh, Stand Up and Speak Out, um, it is full of uh, her insights um, into um, the process of uh, reconciliation. And um, she's speaking to us uh, remotely today, and I'm very glad to have her here. Welcome, Monica. Thank you very much. Um, I am speaking remotely today because here in Belfast, I'm actually still involved in this process of reconciliation. It may indeed be a long and winding path, um, but for me, for the last 25 years since I signed the Good Friday Agreement, 
it has been a roller coaster. And I'm working as hard today, indeed this morning, and right up to the, I started this session, with a group of retired politicians from that agreement. And 25 years ago, we couldn't have sat down together um, to discuss this issue and the other issues that ha we had on the table this morning to deal with the legacy of the past, to deal with our groups that are still involved, to deal with how we reconcile each other over this issue of Brexit, with the UK having decided to leave Europe, when in fact we were convinced back in 1998 that we would remain in Europe. And that session has just finished. So really the lesson, and from the last speaker, I, I take it that he said that it was 15 years after um, in Poland when they started to talk about how to have a process of remembrance. For us, it's an unfinished business. Um, it's more than 25 years since our ceasefires. Um, and what I'm saying is that there are things today that are possible that were not possible back then. And this morning's session here in Northern Ireland is a particular example of that. Um, I brought this group of retired politicians from each party um, those that were affiliated to the armed groups back then, as well as those in the constitutional parties, um, and my own party, which was a party of cross-community women. I brought them together now to see what we can do to help our peace process. So that's just an example of how this work goes on. We were asked a number of questions for this session, and I'd like to address some of those. And some of them link up to what um, we've just heard. Uh, the first was that, what form did the previous negotiations take? Um, what kind of problems did we face? Well, the first problem I think that we faced was, was there an agreed interpretation of what the causes of the conflict were? Indeed, President Mandela told us when he brought us to South Africa, that if we didn't understand the causes and what had caused the conflict to go on for 30 years, then we wouldn't find a solution. Now I often wonder, had we tried to answer that question as we sat for two years at the negotiations, would we have actually come up with any answer? So sometimes I think you have to set that aside. There was no agreed narrative. There was no master narrative. There was no state narrative. Indeed, it was strongly disputed that the British government's particular narrative was that it was a um, an aggregated crime wave between warring tribes inside Northern Ireland, um, which uh, probably today they wouldn't reiterate that. Um, the constitutional parties had a different narrative, um, and indeed the armed groups themselves. And everyone justified their own narrative. So for two years I listened to a lot of venting, and perhaps that's necessary. Um, could we get to reconciliation if people simply pointed the finger as they did for two years across the table at their opponents, blaming the other side. And indeed, as we've just heard, a lot of propaganda swiveling around in terms of this is my information and it's, I want it to be yours. Um, so those are the issues that we're now resolving. This is timely, this session, because just this week, the British government of Westminster have published the legislation and the title of the legislation is a bill to establish an independent commission uh, for reconciliation and information recovery. I work with the victims of Northern Ireland. I'm the patron of WAVE, the main Nor victims organization that represents all sides. They would argue that it will not create reconciliation and it certainly won't be a system for our process for information recovery for them. So that's the first thing. It was meant to deal with the legacy. We should have dealt with that, by the way. There is a chapter, indeed I wrote it in 1998, into the Good Friday Agreement, um, that we should deal with the victims and that we should set up a process. I regret that it fell off the table um, because we ended up concentrating on what was considered to be the hard issues of policing reform, of governance arrangements, power sharing, um, and, and release of prisoners. Instead of actually taking time to say, have we a timetable? Have we a target for setting up a system of reconciliation that deals with not just the issue of dealing with the legacy, but also integrated education, shared housing, resources for young people, what sustains peace? 
And in fact, it's those soft issues that have turned out to be the hardest of all to resolve. There was a forum established to which I was elected in order to be a peace negotiator, and it was called the Forum for Dialogue and Understanding. In my very first week, I renamed it the Forum for Monologue and Misunderstanding, because that's what negotiators do when they first get into a process. It becomes a monologue. In fact, it's perhaps, as I said, there needed to be some therapy in terms of venting and blaming before we actually got down to the business of deal. How do we reach an agreement? And we did that very quickly in the last week. It wasn't that we didn't understand the interests of the other side. It was how do we reconcile those interests in a way that we can live in this place together peacefully. Quickly on the symbolic gestures that we were asked about, the issue of flags and emblems remains a very contested issue in Northern Ireland. Again, I sat on that committee to reconcile what flag would fly above the parliament. Indeed, we couldn't even reconcile what flowers would be in the parliament because the lily was the flower of the 1916 Easter Rising in the south of Ireland. And the poppy represented the, um, the war, the Second and First World War in terms of veterans. So there was no agreement on which veterans of which wars we should actually um, remember in our own parliament. Um, and that remains a contested issue to this very day. The, um, but I would, if you had time, and many of you won't, if you ever come to Northern Ireland, or if you have time now at this particular symposium, I would urge you to come to see something I never believed I would see in my lifetime. It's an exhibition currently in Parliament buildings. And it's there because it's the centenary of the establishment in 1922, December 22, of the Northern Ireland Parliament after partition. I walked around that exhibition and the figures that were in the 1916 revolution, who would be seen as enemies to the unionists in Northern Ireland, have their portraits now hanging in Parliament buildings, President de Valera, O'Neill, Griffiths, many of those who fought. Alongside them are the pictures of those who established the Northern Ireland Parliament um, and indeed the one party rule for many years, Carson, Craig. And there is actually an Irish flag behind one of those portraits. I never thought I'd see that in the Northern Ireland Parliament. And it is accepted by all as we walk around the Great Hall today. I could not have envisaged that when I signed the agreement. So there are examples of reconciliation. And indeed, the issue now is the how will we celebrate tomorrow and the next day or commemorate the Jubilee, the Platinum Jubilee, given how the monarch is seen in one community and how her role um, for 70 years is celebrated. And indeed, the argument this morning, and probably across Northern Ireland, will be that it will be commemorated and celebrated in a very peaceful fashion. I remember um, the handshake, the famous handshake, that first took place between Queen Elizabeth and Martin McGuinness, or the visit of Queen Elizabeth to you, where you are now sitting in Dublin, and her first words of greeting in Irish, and her act of remembrance in the Garden of Remembrance of those who fell in 1916, as well as those who fell in the First and Second World War, who were Irish citizens. Those are indeed symbolic gestures. But I guess where I'm sitting at the minute, I need more than gestures. Um, and that's the hard work that we're doing. It's how do we get to an agreed interpretation of what we signed back in 1998 with Brexit now coming along and this whole debate over the issue of consent, which we thought we'd once agreed. The other question that I want to quickly address in the limited time that I have is the issue of the geopolitics. We are, you've just been talking about Ukraine and I have worked there. Um, and of course, it's very difficult when parties sit down at a table, there are many other governments involved in the resolution of their difficulties. Our conflict did not have the United Nations involved, 
Um, but it did have the European Union. It did have the um, United States, who remain big players to this very day, and less known South Africa. And I think of all the moments of reconciliation in my two years at the peace table, it was the three days I spent in South Africa. And I write in my book how we came back as changed people because for once we listened to how others entered that transition. The Greek word of transition means going across. And it was a moment in which we did agree that we needed to go across, to take the gun out of politics, to move from militancy to a political way of resolving our difficulties. So the lesson there was that sometimes you need to be taken out of your country and you need to be sitting down. Now, Mandela did say you've brought apartheid to South Africa because we had to do everything separately. But eventually that frozen watchfulness that we had of each other began to melt and we got into a dialogue and into a discussion. And it was a long road when we came back home um, to make that work. But again, the lesson for me was that perhaps we should have done that more often. And maybe we needed to learn from others who were going through the same process at that time. A further question, and perhaps the last one, were the difficult moments. Difficult moments for me during the negotiations were the discussion about releasing prisoners. Um, and indeed, there was a huge debate about whether we were letting terrorists out of prison and what would we do for the victims. I'm glad the Women's Coalition were at the table because there would not have been one word in that peace agreement about victims had we not been at the table. Um, but I went into the prison and convinced the prisoners who, were, who said they were withdrawing their support for the peace negotiations, that the peace negotiations were going nowhere and that they were not going to support them any longer. And we went in and sat down in very strange circumstances. In fact, we were locked in for three hours with quite a difficult individuals who, had, um, who were guilty and convicted of some atrocities. So that earlier question about who do you enter a dialogue with became very important. We did do that and we were successful. They stayed with the process. Um, the question might have been asked, why are you sitting down inside prison with people who were regarded as murderers? But again, it was something that had to be done um, if we wanted in the long term to have everyone included in this deal. But one of the most interesting moments for me was one of the leaders of the Unionist Party asked Jerry Adams, the leader of Sinn Féin, can you explain to me why 10 men died and starved themselves to death on a hunger strike? What ideological cause would lead 10 men ever to end their lives? We never had questions like that at the table. It was a moment of curiosity. It was a moment of exchange in which Jerry Adams had to answer the leader of the Ulster Unionist, who, by the way, had asked the question through the chairperson because he did not speak directly to who he considered to be his enemy at that time, Jerry Adams. And Jerry Adams answered through the chairperson and explained why 10 men had died on that hunger strike. Those moments are rare. And as we heard from the previous speaker, more often what you got was misinformation and propaganda, rumours and lies. And that's why it's important also to have, I would, don't want to emphasise my own role, to have facilitators and to have people who are mediators often inside these processes. Because where people are not speaking directly to each other, we have to find ways in which those exchanges can take place and where better information can be put in place. The lessons, some of them you've just heard earlier about the importance of inclusion. And civil society from which I came was at the table. Um, and I'm very pleased that today we have a United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 that mandates all peace processes to have women at the table, to be more inclusive. If you only have armed groups and old constitutional parties at the table and do not reach out to the new voices in civil society, 
what you'll get is more of the status quo. The second point I'd make is that that's, you, designing the process is key, but getting a comprehensive agenda. Here's the mistake we made. We had on the agreement a section called reconciliation. We got it in on the very last night. It almost did not make its way in. One of the most important things, if you're going to the people, to ask them to say yes to a peace agreement is to show how in future we will actually focus on the issues of what divided us. It fell off the table and I regret it as a negotiator. So the lesson and the final lesson, and I'll stop, is deliver what you promise. Don't leave it as an aspiration. It needs to become a constitutional guarantee. And the same as all other pieces of the agreement. We should have set out a timetable. We should have put in targets. We should have explained how we were going to attempt a process of reconciliation. And yet today, this week, we are left hanging with a British government's proposal on how we will deal with the legacy. And the second part of that legislation is where probably this symposium comes in because it intends to set up an archive that will have academics involved, stakeholders involved, bringing their different narratives to a depository. Um, I hope that may create some information. But that process is very tainted because it's seen as giving an amnesty to perpetrators and breaching international human rights law. And of course, I was the chief commissioner um, of human rights and I drafted the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, which still is gathering dust, by the way. So I leave it with you to say that the implementation part of our process was the most difficult of all. An agreement is a piece of paper delivering those words, particularly on what we aspire to on reconciliation has proved to be the most difficult of all. But we will go on doing it because the prize of peace has been tasted and we will never give that up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, I would really love to take questions with you now, but I think just in the interests of time, um, what I'm proposing to do is introduce our next speaker and then our third speaker, and then we'll take communal questions at the end, if that's okay with you. And I do sympathize. I know being remote, it's a bit more difficult, but thank you very, very much, sincerely, for that contribution. Thanks, Monica. Um, our next speaker is um, Marcus Meckel. Um, I was very interested when I was reading your website and all of your contributions on the current state of Ukraine um, just in the last uh, 48 hours. Um, and I was struck by their wisdom, it has to be the wisdom of your comments. Um, you're a the theologian, a philosopher. You've served as a pastor in Mecklenburg. You've chaired an ecumenical education centre, but in the 70s and 80s, uh, you were part of the democratic opposition. Um, and with your friend, uh, Martin Goodseat, I hope I haven't destroyed the name, you founded the Social Democratic Party. In 1990, you were um, elected a member of the first East, uh, of the East German Parliament, and you were foreign minister of the GDR. You took part in the negotiations for re reunification and you were a member of the Bundestag until 2009. Um, interestingly, fr from the perspective of our uh, interests here today, you were behind the idea of the first commission of inquiry into the communist dictatorship in the GDR, uh, and you were behind the ENCAT commission. And you um, have also clearly, and this is known to all your colleagues here, you helped found this very organization. So it's my great pleasure to ask you to uh, give us uh, your comments and thoughts today. Thank you very much uh, for your introduction and welcoming me. I, I'm very impressed by the speeches before. Uh, and so it is not so easy um, to start again. Um, I would like to start with our current situation. I am really very afraid that even in these weeks and months, uh, it happens that a new 
reconciliation is a challenge for the future. Um, if we look to, the, um, to Putin's war against Ukraine, uh, if we see what is happening there, um, it is a disaster not only for Ukraines, um, but also for Europe at all, and for Russians. Uh, I know uh, a few, personally very good, and I know about others. For them, it's a disaster too, what Putin is doing. And the question is, what does it mean for the future? Uh, if you remember the days before the start, the war started, Putin's speech, it, it dealt about history. It was instrumental, instrumentalizing history, in a fake history, um, to give reasons for the war, to give reasons not to acknowledge Ukraines as a nation and as an independent nation, and we have to deal with, I think. It is a question for us um, what, uh, and to bring it together, that on the one hand, external, there is that war for Russia, but internal, there is a dictatorship. And there are a lot of people who are suffering in Russia itself. And so, um, I remember about a German experience in Second World War. There was a very little resistance movement and people who resisted the Nazi dictatorship. Uh, and they had international contacts. For instance, there was um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was only one of um, more. Um, he was in co very good contact in the ecumenical, in the church, international church uh, communication with Bishop George Bell in uh, Great Britain. Um, and uh, George Bell, uh, member of the House of Lords, uh, raised that issue there and criticized, for instance, the bombing and the question how to deal with that and how to cooperate uh, with that resistance in Germany. And we know it wasn't done. And for Germans, after the war, it was very difficult because they were all, they were all identified uh, with the, what the fascists, what the Nazi regime did. And so I think um, it is a challenge for us in the future. And it, I think it could be uh, interesting and a task for the European network too. That question, um, how to deal after the war with the war with responsibility. Is it a Russian war? Or is it really Putin's war as a dictator and an imperial uh, leader? Um, how the, is it connected with ethnicity? Or is it a question of values? Um, really to stand for values, and we know that there are a lot of Russians who stand for our values too. And I think it should be a dialogue with Russians, including Russians, about that question uh, in the future. And this is my first uh, remark uh, I would like to give. The other point is the German uh, experience. This is clear after Second World War, after uh, the 12 years of um, national socialism, um, we are burdened with uh, marvelous guilt towards really all European countries, but especially the youth and the peoples in the East. It was um, a marvelous uh, war which, in similar way, didn't recognize the dignity of other peoples, especially in the East. For France, there was an old heritage of 
being enemies on the same level against Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians, and in the East. The ideology of National Socialism was that they are less, in a less way, real human beings. And exactly that uh, continued after the war as a challenge to understand it and to deal with. And uh, I can't tell you the whole story, but it took a long time in Germany really to deal with that because in the end of the war, the Germans suffered too. And a lot of Germans remembered at first their own suffering um, and not all tried to wait up against uh, what Germans did otherwhere. And it needed decades in the end to understand that we are responsible coming from this being guilty. At first it was France. And this was a precondition uh, for the foundation of the European Union um, that this reconciliation between France and Germany established a common understanding that uh, to prevent a future war have common economic integration. That was the first step. It was not enough, but the European Union from the beginning was a peace project. And I think it is important until now uh, to have and uh, to remain uh, it in our minds. Um, there was, for instance, um, one uh, man in the western part of Germany, ein Staatsanwalt, wie heißt der Name? Prosecutor, a prosecutor in Frankfurt, uh, Fritz Bauer. He was social democrat, he was in the concentration camp. Uh, he was the initiator of the Auschwitz. Uh, uh, to bring the perpetrators of Auschwitz uh, to the court. And he, almost 20 years after the end of the war, said, if I leave my office in Frankfurt, I am very often feeling in a hostile, in a hostile country against myself and for that people who suffered in the war, almost 20 years after the war. And uh, I think this is important to understand that this way which Germany is uh, we're going uh, was a way of really encouraged people, in the beginning only a few, to fight for overtaking responsibility for that being guilty and to take it not only inside or in your heart, but also public and in the behavior uh, to the others. Um, the reconciliation with France, I mentioned it, was important for Europe at all. For the East it was difficult because the Eastern countries, who suffered much more than the Western one, were under the communism, suffering under the communism, and it was easy for many people in the West to continue with anti-communism, um, which was a part of ideology in the Nazi time too, um, and it was not so easy to reconcile with communist countries, because usually the citizens, the population, was identified with the system. And so, especially with Poland, it was a very important uh, step that in the society, there were people, and especially the churches, who started this reconciliation. In the middle of the 60s, there was the Protestant church with a declaration uh, about the border which was against the majority and against the policy of the government in that time. Then there was this important letter of the Polish bishops 
with their sentence, we forgive, a Polish word, we forgive, and we ask for forgiveness. And the communist government was not so astonished and was very angry um, about that. But it was these both declarations and letter was a starting point for society, for a lot of people to come together. And it was mentioned, especially then after 1990, uh, for a lot of uh, communication meetings. Uh, so it become a deep experience that reconciliation between Germans and Poles. And if you look to Russia, if you look to Belarus and Ukraine, it is interesting that uh, even last year, there was argumentation by a high politician in Germany saying that because of our responsibility towards Russia, he was in favor of the <coughs> Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And uh, you have to understand that uh, what was the mistake? The mistake is that that responsibility from that background of the history is a history and the responsibility towards Soviet Union countries, population, the peoples of Soviet Union, not just Russians. The first victims of the occupation of Soviet Union were the Ukrainians and were the Belarusians and other little peoples too. And the German misunderstanding that starting and looking just to Russia is a marvelous mistake in that remembrance uh, and the understanding of our responsibility. And I think um, this is now really changing and has changed. But it was for a long time a really problem of German um, heritage of uh, our responsibility and thinking. And so I think it is uh, important uh, that we have to learn for our history. If I remember that we had last year in the German Bundestag um, a debate about uh, the starting fighting against Soviet Union in June 41. And only one speaker from the AfD mentioned the Hitler-Stalin pact. The others not. The others not. Although uh, it was the, the war against the peoples and all the um, crimes started in 39 uh, with the Hitler-Stalin pact. And it is neglected in Russia until today. We as Germans, together with the Soviet Union, are responsible for all these crimes happening in Poland, in the Baltic states. The war against Finland by Soviet Union couldn't happen without that treaty. And even, I would say, even the, the murdering, the shooting of Polish officers in Katyn and in other places. This communist crime has, is a part of German responsibility too because without that treaty, it couldn't happen. I think what we need is much more an integrated understanding of that history. We in Germany very often have a remembrance very limited to special branches and different to each other. On the one hand of national communism, on the other hand of communism, on the other hand the question of expulsion or the question of war, all that is dealt usually separate, in my view, 
that's totally wrong. And we have to get in a better dialogue, especially with Poland, with Russians, with Ukrainians, because only in that dialogue about our remembrance, we get the whole picture. Reconciliation needs the whole truth, not only our own heritage of knowledge. And it needs much more information, which is in the German population not really aware. And that's why I am happy that the German Bundestag um, had a resolution to establish a center uh, for the crimes in the war in whole Europe, but especially in the eastern part, uh, to inform about that in all that differentiated way, and I think that is important. Reconciliation is usually starting by concrete persons, not by the state. Reconciliation is not a thing you can demand from others. Reconciliation can only be given. I remember that Václav Havel immediately after 1990 uh, said that he is, uh, sich entschuldigen, no. apologize, <laughs> that he apologized for the expulsion of Germans from the Sudetenland, from the that Czech part where two, millions, two million Germans lived. And he was, uh, that was not acknowledged by his own population. It needed a lot of years uh, to make that popul uh, possible because in communist times nobody got that knowledge. No, well, nobody, it was not dealt with for decades uh, about that history and especially about that framework at all. And so you ask the question of time. The time question is, in my view, very important and it needs time to get reconciliation. And it has to be accepted by the victims. And it has not to be just a political act. I think this is very important. Um, we got, as Germans, that experience of reconciliation, and we can be happy about even the next generations. But the responsibility about what happened is a remaining one. Thank you very much. and I will be seeking guidance in a moment from the organizers. Somebody's going, okay, okay. So <laughs> I, need, I need advices, as they say. It is my, last but not least, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our Romanian panelist contributor. Um, Teodor Melescanu has been professor at the National School of Political Science and Public Administration uh, in Bucharest since 2013. Um, and you were previously in the Faculty of Political Science in Bucharest between 1992 and 2013. And your uh, I suppose your, your discipline is law. You're an international um, lawyer, PhD, uh, and that's from Geneva. Um, your career with Romania's public service uh, spans uh, an, a, a, a number of years, 1992, 96, 2014, 2017, 19, and in, indeed, you were the interim uh, minister for justice in 2008, and you've also been a minister of defense. Now, I know you're very uh, interested in the role of treaties and the role of borders and also the role of external um, actors and mediation. And I think that's what you're going to focus on today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first of all to congratulate you for your excellent idea to have 
as a subject here about the uh, European network remembrance and solidarity, and it is really referred to the peace and reconciliation. It's not something, let's say, ideal. Today, when we speak here in this beautiful Trinity College, people are, are dying in, in Ukraine. Uh, kids are, are dying there. You destroy infrastructure and others. That's why, really, I think it's not simply to, to try to offer a, a certain uh, benevolence of, on our side. No, it is an excellent idea, and we have to take it as it should be done properly. What is happening practically? The problem, the big issue of, uh, of the existing of the relationship between and Ukraine and the Federation, uh, the Russian Federation, it is unfortunately not based on any legal agreement about the borders. The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, he delivered a very clear and interested deposition saying that after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, no one accepted legally to draw the different forts, parts of the, of the borders. And this is the reality. You, I, you cannot say you have passed over my border. It does not exist. This is the problem. What is happening now, practically, today? We can bring more weapons. We can bring, uh, we can bring uh, more attacks. Uh, we can bring a lot of things, but nobody is really thinking and discussing about what should be, how can we really arrive at a conclusion which is acceptable for both uh, parties. Without this, it's impossible to discuss about it. I, I repeat, you can kill all the people, you can uh, use all the, the, the weapons, including sometimes there are references about the nuclear uh, weapons and so on and so on. This is not a solution. The solution is to put, to stay, to start negotiating, uh, negotiating at that same table and looking for some results. From this point of view, I want to tell you, now you understand why I fought very seriously about having the border agreement between Romania and Hungary. It's not because I wanted to do it. It's simply because it is really one of the most important um, position of Romania. And that's why it, it happened. Of course, this is uh, our interest. Of course, uh, Hungary said yes, but could be also important to support our ethnic groups in, uh, in Romania. And at this moment, we realize that we have two different interests. Secondly, that we have one interest joining NATO, both Hungary and, uh, uh, and Romania. And the third one is also to have somebody to push us, more or less. From this point of view, of course, we discussed a long uh, time. We put it on a piece of paper, more piece of pa pieces of papers. But we realized that without the support of, for example, of the United States to join NATO, it will be very difficult for both countries. We are doing, I mean, both Romania, both Hungary. We were very interested to join NATO. And they, you know, for them it's not only uh, thinking about uh, something. In 1956, the Warsaw Treaty included, I mean, arrived in, in, in Hungary and destroyed this, the system which existed. Do not forget that in 1968, the Warsaw Treaty uh, 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 philosophy was to destroy the, how do you, of course, we print, print on, uh, spring, 
The Spring, the spring, the spring Czechoslovakia. That's why it was just one, one crazy party, one, one, one simply, uh, 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 I mean, one of, of, the, of those who are not, they, they did not decide to join the Warsaw Treaty for, uh, for uh, Czechoslovakia. That, it was Romania. It's the only uh, difference. But for the rest of the countries, all of them were in uh, destroying the, the spring of Prague. All these issues are really demonstrating that we need legal systems to have our borders. We have to take care into it and also to use them. That's why look at, at Finland. If you look at, at, at the Russian Federation, you realize that Finland, which is one of the possible candidates for, for NATO, has a border of 1,400 kilometers. But uh, Russians never said, they, they never combated it. They, they realized they have a border between Finland and the, uh, and the uh, Soviet, I mean, uh, Russian Federation. That's why I think uh, we have to, to concentrate on these issues. You need legal instruments and use them. You have different ideas, okay? You can arrange this. We are interested to have the border. Hungarians wanted to support the, uh, the, the minorities. Both of them can be solved, but it's not easy. That's why finally, at a certain moment, uh, Warren Christopher, who was the state secretary in the United States, we had a visit, I had a visit there, and he said, what happens, why don't you conclude this? And said, yes, there are, are some differences, our colleagues have some problems. He said, okay, may I take, call my, uh, my colleague from, uh, from Budapest? And he said, listen, I look at it, I mean, it's a good treaty, everything is okay. Why don't you sign it? He said, yes, yeah, okay. Finally, it was signed in 23 of August, 1995. It happened, it's working, and it's working very well. And I do not have too much time, but I simply wanted to tell you how, is, how was happening about it. How was the reflection of the advantages for Hungary in comparison with, uh, with Romania? And I can tell you something. The first ethnic group in uh, Romania, which represents 5%, it's uh, the Hungarians, it was they created the first political party after, after 1990. They were the first one. There are others also, and we arrived at, uh, at, uh, in, the, in the parliament 19 representatives of minorities provided that, could, that they could get some 5,000 votes. It's different compared with other elections. And these deputies are, may I tell them, it's Hungarian, Roma, Gypsy, Ukrainian, German, uh, Lipovian, Russian, Turk, Turks, Tartars, Serbian, Czechs and Slovaks, Bulgarian, Croats, Greek, Jewish, Italian, Polish, Armenian, Macedonian, Albanian, Ruthenian. We have 19 of those uh, representatives in the Romanian parliament. Why is it so important? Because, of course, they are promoting uh, their the development of the history, of uh, their language, and all these issues, that's very normal. But it's not everything. They are working in the parliament. They can come with amendments. They can change some uh, uh, rules or, or others. That's why I, I simply say it's, it's, very, uh, it's very practical. If you have ethnic groups, of course nobody is uh, white. In, in all countries, you have different peoples, I mean, different ethnic uh, uh, groups. But if you take care of them, if you really offer them the possibility to have, to, to study their language from the kindergarten to the university, of course, they will be very happy and try to develop 
in, in, in the future as well. That's why, as I said, I mean, I, we have to look at it very clearly to take into account all these uh, issues. Uh, we, we speak about Ukraine. There are nine, nine million Russians in, in Ukraine. Uh, there are uh, one million Romanians in, uh, in Bukovina. Uh, 150,000 Hungarians in Trans Caucasia, Transcarpathia. All these issues, they should not be taken, I mean, aside. You look at it, try to find a solution, and also take into account the possibilities for different elements of, of this country to continue to develop in the, in the future. That's why I really say, look at it, think about it. You can offer much more armaments from the West. It will not solve the problem. The problem is solved finally, as I said, during the negotiations at the same table and also finding a solution which is acceptable for both countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing um, I'd like to tell everybody is that I've been uh, told by uh, one of the organizers that we do have another 10, 15 minutes for, for OK. So the first thing is, is does anybody from the audience want to ask a question? I suggest that, uh, given that Professor Williams is on Zoom, it would be nice to address our uh, questions to her first. But uh, does anyone have a question? Yes. And two. I've got two questions. Three. I have three. This man in the middle. Uh, yeah. It doesn't. Oh, we can start wherever you like. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I, my name is Tibor Toro. I'm a political scientist at the University of Sapientia in cluj napoca Kolozhva, Romania. Uh, <clears throat> and I would like to ask a question related to the Irish Language Act. How do you see uh, this? Uh, as far as I understood now, it's uh, on debating, or, or at least will be on debate in Westminster. And how do you see this? act uh, will affect the process in uh, Northern Ireland? You know, uh, you know on, honestly, uh, in... in uh, That's actually for Professor Williams, I think. It's, it, Professor Williams, did you get that question? It's in relation to the Irish Language Act? Ah. Sorry, the sound is gone. Um, can you bear with us, Monica? Just give yep. me a... Oh, Okay, sound is back. Monica, just in case you didn't get the question, it related to that. I did, I did. You did, I did get I did, the I question. Did. Yeah. Um, the issue has been resolved now through Westminster. Um, it should not have been left to Westminster because it was a devolved matter. And indeed, when I was Chief Commissioner um, 12 years ago, I recommended that we do what Europe does and have the language recognised as a minority language in terms of the international standards. But because there was so much opposition at the time, and it goes back to the issue of culture and symbols and language, which we thought we had agreed and made a deal in the agreement, um, but it wasn't implemented, nor indeed was my proposal as Commissioner for Human Rights taken up. So it lay on the table, and they could not agree in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, and so when the Northern Ireland Assembly collapsed um, the, the last time, um, Westminster agreed that it would put the, the legislation through. The compromise was that it would also recognise a, um, a dialect language. There's a dispute whether it's a language or a dialect known as Ultra Scots. But as far as I'm concerned, the issue is done and we will now move forward, which is a, a step forward on that particular thorny issue. Thanks, Monica. We have a second question over here. Just waiting for the mics, Monica. Thank you very much. My name is Greg Christiansmeyer, and I'm working on youth exchange in post-conflict regions. Um, and I would also have a question to you regarding the situation in Ireland. So, especially when looking at the young genera generations, which did not feel the conflict itself, which uh, only live with the consequences today, with the um, screwed up politics and uh, uh, the ever 
persistent uh, attentions. So what would you say is their role? What is their place also on the future negotiating table and in this um, question of reconciliation and looking ahead, which you um, said is a very important issue, uh, but maybe not done enough so far. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. It's also in the agreement that we would have set aside resources for uh, working with young people. And it didn't happen. It's beginning to happen now. Um, and this is a really important question about the next generation, not just in terms of the trauma, because we are a traumatized society and we haven't dealt with even those victims whose parents have passed on the narratives of the trauma they experienced. Um, but because we're such a small country, it's probably true to say that every young person um, has some form of memory, um, and they are the memory car carriers. Um, but they're not a homogeneous group, as we know. And so the young ones that I'm working with to try and keep them away from the clutches of the paramilitary organizations, it's interesting, a piece of research was done recently asking why would young men, particularly young men, but increasingly some young women, aspire to becoming a paramilitary? And the, that piece of research um, concluded that there were two things that made a difference, sometimes in the same family between brothers and sisters, was that women civilize men, and that if the young man had a girlfriend, she was mu he was much less likely to get involved in um, antisocial behavior or indeed in paramilitary activity. And also, as we know, if there was a status outside of being unemployed. Um, and so there lies the issue of training, employment, education. But for those young people that you're talking about, I am so pleased to hear that you've brought that up because for me, that's the number one issue that I'm working on. We have set up a group called Politics and Action in Schools. So for this symposium, you would be interested to hear that one of the most difficult topics of all in our schools is the issue of politics and how to remember the conflict. And the teachers are fearful because the parents don't want the teachers um, to be talking about it. So, and you know our schools are segregated, 92% of schools are segregated. Only 8% um, learn together under the one roof. So what we've done, and perhaps even COVID helped with this because we were able to do it virtually using the internet. We've brought the kids together in the different schools, twinning them, Catholic Protestant school in predominantly low income districts, which are the most disadvantaged as in also because of the impact of the conflict. And that's working well. Um, and there are other examples you heard earlier today from the minister about the fund for reconciliation. Um, and those funds are also being directed towards keeping young people away from what we call every summer or disturbances around bonfires, which again are about remembrance, those fires every year, or bonfires every year, which have already started to gather all the debris for them, are celebrated on the 12th of July and the eve of the 12th of July, everyone starts getting very anxious about the fires getting out of control and the level of pollution. So again, some funds through the International Fund for Ireland, um, which comes from the United States, Canada, um, and um, Australia um, have donated a substantial sum of money um, to regulate those. And the people who will be doing the regulation are the young people. So these are all good examples of how we're trying to engage that generation um, in a more peaceful way. Um, and, and we don't know yet whether it'll be good, uh, good outcomes, but at least we're taking the risk and we're going to try and see um, how well we can do. And I want to give a shout out for our youth workers who I know um, have created a high level of resilience in other communities. They are out on the streets. They are actually talking to the parents about where their young people are uh, because particularly over these parades and protests around Brexit. And the one thing I want is to ensure that none of those young people get prosecuted and get sent to jail and have a criminal record for the rest of their lives because I've seen the impact that that's had when we had the outbreak over the which flag would fly on the city hall of Belfast about five six years ago and I visited those young people in prison um, and they were devastated because they had got caught up in something their adrenaline was pumping 
They thought it was exciting, probably as many of us did when we were teenagers all those years ago, when the troubles first broke out. Um, and now they're going to have to suffer the consequences for the rest of their lives. If they apply for employment, the first question they will be asked is, have you got a criminal record? So those are all the lessons, and I'm very glad that you asked that question, because that, it's something this symposium, if it's talking about a long and winding path, that's the path that we don't want to be so long and winding for the next generation. Thank you, Professor. We've, 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 we've one, one other question from, do you have the mic now, Matt? You do. Yeah. A very proud dairy woman. Um, I want to applaud. I want to applaud Monica uh, for her role as a woman in the peace process. And I think part of the question has been answered nearly. But Monica, given the very difficult, contested spaces and people that you were dealing with, who weren't even able to sit in the same room when they were doing the negotiations. What little gem of wisdom have you got for this current impasse that we have at the minute for the politicians who are struggling to set up a parliament again? The pearl of wisdom came from the last two speakers and all of their experience on what works. And I think the lesson that you've heard is dialogue. And when you're in a crisis, pick up the phone, find a back channel, find one person on the other side that you can talk to um, and get quickly into a room with that person. Um, and that's what we're doing. Uh, you don't hear much of it. And actually, I try to stay away from um, the radio and television and commentary um, because much of this work goes on below the radar um, and you have to be very sensitive in terms of anything you might say publicly. Um, but we've learned that lesson. Um, and I have to say that we should look at the pockets of resilience and the places where there's not an outbreak and where it is peaceful, because that's the message I want to send to investors who want to invest in Northern Ireland, um, because we are part of the single market and we're also part of the UK market. It's a good enough deal. But there are issues around it that need to be fixed, of course. Um, but the most important thing is get back in around the table, get into that dialogue and iron out our problems. We don't always need international mediators to come back to Northern Ireland to help us with it. We've now learned how to do it. Um, and you heard from the speakers about the importance of human relationships, about the chemistry of leaders. And I've seen it in my lifetime and I've seen what a difference it makes. Finding the humanity in the other person even when that person is your opponent. Thank you, Professor Williams. I'd like to now uh, ask, are there questions for our other two panelists, please? Yes, sorry, I, my tunnel vision, I beg your pardon. You're excused. <laughs> um, I want to connect the first and the second uh, presentation. I feel strange when we address uh, the question of reconciliation, if we do not speak also whether there is an objective truth behind reconciliation. Not all situations uh, request reconciliation, I would say. Some situations request only justice. When the Nazis invented Greece, uh, of course the partisans killed a lot of young Germans. And I have visited graves of German soldiers from the Second World War killed in Greece. Should Greeks request forgiveness and approach reconciliation with Germans because they resisted? I would say no. So when we speak of reconciliation, it's important for me to also give the floor. Why do we need this reconciliation and what is the objective truth behind reconciliation? Not all situations are the same. Is, for example, the war in Ukraine the same like um, the civil war in Northern Ireland? I don't know. I'm just saying that since we bring these discussions together, yes, I agree, uh, since we bring these discussions together, somehow it seems that we will um, overcome examining the differences, and some differences are very 
important in order to discuss whether reconciliation is needed and in what way. Um, that's just a comment. Maybe we'll address this on the next two days, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that recon reconciliation is based on an objective truth. And in war, especially when, when we speak about uh, inventing another country, the objective truth is resistance. Thank you. Could, could I ask you, uh, Dr. Merkel, Merkel, to respond to that? And then I believe we have to wrap. I think, it is, I think it's very important what you ask, because because we have to differentiate in our wording and it is a question if reconciliation can be a po political goal. I doubt. Uh, because reconciliation is a personal issue and it can develop as an issue of societies by youth exchange, by changing the behavior by understanding, mutual understanding, to get more information not only from my parents but also uh, from others in meeting each other to um, see uh, as a German a pole, a concrete face and a concrete fate and to understand it, it's and her or his fate. Uh, and that's why it is so important to read biographies or to tell each other that. But politics can only give a floor, a room, uh, for that kind of meeting each other. Hoping, hopeful that it can happen reconciliation. That's why I think uh, what you mentioned is so important to get acknowledged commitment to get a legal framework for international communication and the legal framework for um, states for states to deal with each other. And I think this is our political goal, to come to this back. Uh, what Putin is doing is to destroy all what Russia and all other European countries signed as a commitment, as a legal basis for our international communication uh, and dealing with each other. And to establish this again, I think, is very important. And that's why is what is happening in Ukraine is not just helping the victim Ukrainians. It is really fighting for re-establishing that kind of... Uh, exactly, uh, uh, exactly to do that for the international law and to get again in the international framework. The question of reconciliation is a human being goal in the conversation, in the communication between human beings and hopefully then it will shape the life of societies in the cross-border uh, communica communication. That's my consideration uh, in response to the question. It's not really a, 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 an answer, but I think in, in this direction I would think. Thank you very much. Um, I'm under the absolute whip to conclude this session now. I'm sure you all are dying for a cup of coffee. Yes. Can I add some? You can add. Can I add in senses? Uh, coming back to my proposal with um, for European uh, network, I think really, because I'm really so afraid about the future between Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians. Could it be possible to establish that communication between network, 
Memorial and Svetlana Teranovskaya and uh, in that way to bring that together and for a common consideration how to meet that challenge in the future. This is coming together as people, not as states, but as people from different nationalities and ethnicities making clear that what we uh, have now is not the question of states or nations. It's a question of values which are destroyed by an uh, imperium, by an imperator. Well, I think we can all agree with that and perhaps hope that uh, you do manage to get that uh, contact going. Thank you very much. Very sorry to have run over. Sure you're going to uh, want your coffee. Thanks to Monica Williams, to Dr. Shabinsky, to Dr. Maniscanu, and indeed to yourself, um, Dr. Meckel. Thank you very much. Okay, so just for a minute more. So we'll have to shorten the break and we'll now have 10 minutes break and then 10 past four. Let's meet here for the second panel. 15? Okay, let's make it 15. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Oh yeah, this is on. Okay, thank you so much. There's Professor Ritzak also. Hello to you on screen. We'll come back to you in a second, okay? Um, so let me first extend my thanks to the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, also to the Glen Cree Center for Peace and Reconciliation for organizing this event. I had the pleasure of being three years ago in Paris at an event and the long chain of cities all over Europe show us that uh, it's a map of thinking, I would say, and consciousness, of historical consciousness, and I think this is what it's all about. Um, let me take up um, a thing Marcus Meckel just said about, about reconciliation being human and belonging to the human level, whereas um, other things belong to the state. And I think I, we will touch upon this more than once today. Um, there's a beautiful opening by great American author William Gaddis, who wrote a satirical novel on justice. And the very first lines of the dialogue say, justice, you get justice in the next world. In this world, there's the law. <laughs> and then he goes on on six, 700 pages to explain that the law is a huge system you can get lost in. So let me um, tell you what we'll do today. We'll have four experts, one on screen, three off screen, and myself to um, have uh, brief presentations of ideas of various fields of knowledge and investigation. And we'll do them in, alphabetically, uh, in alphabetical order, and I will present our speakers in that order too. Each one is allotted five minutes, so don't take out your watches because some people will do that themselves. They promised to me. I'll try to keep time, okay? So, um, to my right is Robert Gerwart, Professor of Modern History at UCD here in Dublin and Director of its Center for War Studies. I remember his uh, important book on the losers of the First World War, and we had an encounter here at UCD some years back and also um, his collaborations with Jay Winter, also a historian well known to the European network. Um, so I welcome him. Then there's Jaroslav Ritzak, uh, whom we have on screen, Ukrainian historian, um, professor at the U Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Um, and his most recent book is Overcoming the Past, Global History of Ukraine, and this is a field of knowledge that all you Europe and the world will be reading, uh, Professor, because now we can inform ourselves what this is all about. It is about uh, a few hundred years of history, and that's important, I think, to know. Um, then to the second to my right is Ernest Bitschiev. Now. Bechitschkiewicz, I, I practiced that a little bit. Bechitschkiewicz, I think this is okay. More or less, Ernest, thank you so much for being generous with me. He's a political scientist and the director of the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding. He has been in that function since 2016. Uh, he's published widely. And um, on my far right is Howard Varney. He's a lawyer and a senior program advisor with the International Center for Transitional Justice in South Africa. And um, he was the chief investigator for the Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So you, need, you see the word crops up everywhere, reconciliation. And I think this is a very apt title for what we try to do here. But remember, all these terms are difficult, are contested, truth, justice, memory, facts. Um, I would like to ask our contributors now to start with Robert Gerwart and his um, intervention on the First World War. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the, is that on? Can you hear me? Um, yeah? Uh, no? Okay. It's not on. No, no, now it is. Excellent. So thanks very much for the, uh, for the introduction and indeed for uh, including me um, in, in this panel. Um, obviously, there's a sort of long history going back to 
uh, collaboration uh, with the network on the exhibition on the Great War, which some of you might uh, see later on, and in uh, which I have been uh, involved. Um, I'd like to pick up on some of the ideas and discussion points that came up uh, in the previous panel, uh, notably, I think, on the need to understand root causes of conflicts in order to be able to resolve them uh, longer term. And uh, obviously, I would say that uh, as a historian, I suppose, I suppose. But also because in the current discussion, we frequently have historical references that are used as um, analogies in order to understand uh, contemporary conflicts. And uh, the most recent one, uh, perhaps most high-powered one, of course, was uh, just a few weeks ago on the uh, 9th of May, when uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, marked the 77th uh, anniversary of Nazi Germany's defeat uh, with a speech to the European Parliament, obviously set against the uh, current war in Ukraine, the first major war in Europe since 1945, with the exception of the armed conflicts in ex-Yugoslavia in the 1990s, uh, Macron engaged in a kind of exercise in applied history. Uh, what did he ask? Is our aim in the face of Russia's unilateral decision to invade Ukraine and to attack its people? End this war as swiftly as possible. Do everything in our power so that Ukraine can hold out to the end and that Russia can never triumph. In order to achieve a durable peace in Europe, so he continued, we will need together to never give in to the temptation of humiliation, nor the spirit of revenge, because these have already in the past wreaked enough havoc on the roads to peace." End of quote. Macron's speech presumably <coughs> echoed, uh, particularly or resonated uh, with audiences in Germany and France, two countries long locked in a state of Erbfeindschaft or hereditary enmity embodied by the two treaties of Versailles of 1871 and 1919 that prompted repeated waves of irredentism and revengeism. The French and the Germans, so Macron's implicit message, had learned their lessons from the past to avoid unnecessarily humiliating and vengeful peace treaties and to seek cooperation instead of confrontation. I thought that uh, Macron's speech uh, was interesting for another reason, uh, because the public debate about Ukraine uh, is rife with references to World War II in the 1990s, to promises made in the aftermath of the Cold War, and to roads not taken then. Far less frequent are discussions about the First World War, which ended in the fall of the Romanovs and the loss of most of their empire's western borderlands. More than any uh, other Western politician, Macron was very heavily involved in the centenary uh, commemorations of the First World War, indeed chairing personally the expert commission on how to commemorate, commemorate uh, that war. Amidst the chaos of the uh, period commemorated then, Ukraine, like many other aspiring nations in East Central Europe, declared its independence, which was nominally confirmed through the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk between the Central Powers and the new Bolshevik government. Even if Ukraine was reabsorbed into the emerging Soviet Union in 1922, uh, this moment of brief moment of Ukrainian uh, independence and the loss of other territories that Russia had long laid claim to, from Finland to the Baltic states to eastern Poland, remained a major Russian trauma comparable to Turkey's obsession with the Treaty of Sevres um, of 1920, in which the imploding Ottoman Empire was stripped of its territories in the Middle East, uh, while Anatolia was to be partitioned. So I would argue here that not unlike President Erdogan, uh, Putin's nostalgia for Russia's imperial past, combined with the fear of Western uh, liberal imperialism that also dates back uh, to the days of US President Woodrow Wilson and the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George remains an underappreciated prism through which his actions can be better understood. The look back to the end of the First World War might offer clues to the deeper historical origins of the current uh, war in Ukraine and to the mindsets in the Kremlin driving it, but perhaps not how to solve it. The Paris Peace Treaties of 1919-1920 uh, 
uh, infamously tried to reduce the potential for armed conflict in the post-imperial successor states of East Central Europe through a combination of measures. Uh, the new successor states, that's probably the, the most positive element of the Versailles Treaty, um, had to sign the so-called minorities treaties, guaranteeing the rights of ethnic or religious minority communities within their borders. However, where inter-ethnic conflicts were deemed to be unresolvable through such treaties, the victorious allies implemented a policy of permanent segregation through either partitions, as in Upper Silesia, or indeed in Northern Ireland, or expulsions, as in Western Anatolia. And the latter were to become the dominant form of radical population politics in East Central Europe until the later 1940s. Time. <laughs> I'll try to wrap up in one minute because I'm coming to the point now because I think that the search for a historical template uh, for a good peace can therefore not end in 1919. It would either take us further into the past, thinking in particular of the Congress of Vienna of 1814-15, uh, or indeed to the much more recent Good Friday Agreement. And what both have in common is that they generated um, peace without victors, that they acknowledged uh, the fact that um, vindictiveness is not a way out of a never-ending cycle um, of violence. And I believe that, again, there will probably be no lasting peace in East Central Europe, no enduring international security order, if such a, a peace repeats the errors of the past and prioritizes vindictiveness over the willingness to compromise. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. I think we'll go, we delve deeper in our second round of questions or um, I forgot to say earlier, we'll have time for questions from the audience if we, you know, keep at our speed, okay? Uh, thank you so much. Now, Professor Hitzak, you are far away from us. How are you over there where you are thank now you. in Lviv? I'm, I'm fine and I'm safe. Thank you for asking. Um, I, can we turn up the volume a little bit? Because the professor cannot be heard very, la very well. Let's try. Can you hear me now? Yeah. If you just give it a booming voice, if you can. Your loudest voice, and then the technician will do his. That I did already, so. Okay. Thank you. So. This so, is a maximum. Okay, this is okay. Um, Thank yes, you. Yes, have, you have the floor. Thank you so much for having me here at this important event. And really, I really feel sorry they could join you there physically offline. But under circumstances, I would rather not risk to leave my family because anything could happen. And I'm relatively safe, as far as I can be. And I'll be talking about reconciliation. This is the topic which is nowadays becoming more and more urgent under these circumstances. And I'm wearing two hats, one hat of a professional historian and the second hat of the public intellectual. So actually, I'm not just uh, uh, studying historical reconciliation, also practicing historical reconciliation. I have my own record of the successes and failures, and I would gladly share it with you. But let me start with my hat of historian. So just to provide a very short historical context. So if you think about Ukraine, the probably closest parallel will be Palestine. I mean, the relatively small region where uh, supposedly local conflict has a large bearing of the geopolitics. So this is exactly what Ukraine is, or used to be for the last 100 years during the First World War, the Second World War, we naively believe that Ukraine already has passed this, 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 the circumstances, but we know it is going back. So basically what I'm saying here, that because of many variety of reasons, giving the rich resources, uh, grains, uh, oil, uh, coal, coal and uh, steel, and especially cannon fodder, Ukraine has been battleground, and also given the point that Ukraine is a territory which has impact on the Russia itself, so therefore, just put the story brief, Ukraine has been a very important geopolitical borders, but also very vulnerable. Just to give you an idea that since the 1914, beginning of the First World War, and until the end of the Second World War, 1945, it's believed that every second male and every fourth female perished here, died here of a violent death. So this gives you the probably understanding of the scale. So what I'm telling here, driving it here, that for Ukraine, a reconciliation is not a luxury. It's a necessity. 
because otherwise Ukrainians could not survive both physically and as a nation state. So therefore, uh, there has much, much has been done. Uh, uh, if I'm talking about history, so until the 19th century, basically historically, in Ukrainian imagination, popular imagination, there has been four historical enemies. This has been in order Poles, Crimean Tatars, Jews, and to last but not least Russians. So what we managed in the last 30 years, we reconciled most of them. I mean, this reconciliation is post, probably the most important one. There has been a reconciliation with Jews, and the point is that uh, the proof is that Zelensky is uh, himself of uh, Jewish origin. And also there is a reconciliation between Tatars. So basically we reconciled with historical men, means but one, and this is Russia, and therefore we have a war. So uh, that said, that said this, is, this is both good news and, and bad news. But in a sense, I would say Ukraine is very much has been like a Hobbesian war, a war against all. Nowadays, it's not a Hobbesian war, but it's a very serious war. And therefore, and actually, I have to say another dimension here that a part of this global war and international war, there's also a civil war, war between East and West of Ukraine, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking. So, so there is a lot to do for reconciliation. So this is what I'm telling kind of historical, now as a, as a public intellectual. Uh, I believe that basically when Ukraine uh, managed to reconcile, uh, there are various forms, there are no framework, the unilateral framework, there are several frameworks. And I divided it large in two groups. One is a reconciliation by default, which uh, doesn't require specific, specific efforts, it just happened by necessity, by historical circumstances. And I would call this was, this was a reconciliation with Crimean Tatars. It's still there, but no specific effort has been done mostly because Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars are joined by the common enemy, so to say. And this is a quite recent development of the last 50 years. But talking about the Jewish and Polish reconciliation, it's a kind of very much different. It took a lot of efforts on both sides, uh, mostly intellectuals, not politicians. Putin came late on this, on the circumstances. This again proves this, what you said at the very beginning, this reconciliation has much more human dimension than, than state dimension. But uh, among this the, the reconciliation, I believe the, the most important to study and highlight is the Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation, because it, it, it shows us some, some rules or some lessons, because it has both successes and, and deep failures. So just let me remind you that Ukrainians and Poles have been fighting each other for a long time. Some claim this is one of the longest history war in the world in, the, in history, uh, at least for the end of 9th uh, century. And especially it was bloody in the 20th century, during the First World War, and especially specifically during the Second World War, where there has been ethnic cleansing in the Western Ukraine, so-called Volhynia, when Ukrainian nationalists committed a uh, humorous crime, some call it genocide, some call it ethnic cleansing, but this is something which still has bone of contention between Ukrainians and, and Poles in their historical, historical memory. So uh, what happened in 1951, six years after the uh, end of the First World War, Jerzy Gaydritz, editor of the very famous and very influential Polish ingre journal Kultura in Paris. He made a statement that for the sake of Poland, uh, we have to admit that Vilnius is a Lithuanian city and Lviv is a Ukrainian city. Lviv is basically the city where I live now. It's in the Polish-Ukrainian borders and Poles, Poles and Ukrainians claim that this is their, their city. This is a very bold statement. Uh, at that time, in, he made this kind of, made this statement. Gators was uh, ostracized, and he was cursed by the Polish diaspora, both political diaspora and cultural diaspora. He was really outsider. But later on, it was ta take it was taken as a kind of platform for the solidarity, this anti-communist movement, and they call it Jerzy Gators doctrine. So when the, the solidarity came to power in 1981, it took us as a, as a as a platform for the East, Eastern politics, so to say. And there's no coincidence that, that say, Poland was the first one to accept, to recognize Ukrainian independence. It was done, in, it was done on purpose. So that, that, that I know the story that both Valencia and Michnik Kurin spent the whole night sitting by the radio, listening for the first news that uh, result around the result of Ukraine referendum to congratulate Ukraine and accept its independence. This for them was very symbolic, symbolic jest. But still, even there was some general reconciliation in terms of those uh, doctrine, there were some minor uh, fields, and one of them was the military cemetery in Lviv, in my, in my city. 
There has been a military, military cemetery, a cemetery of Poles who have fallen in the war with Ukrainians. And Time, there was Professor, a, if you can come to a close. If you okay. can, so, we so come okay, back I to can. you. Okay, so that, then they come back. So basically what I'm saying here, that what we have now, uh, in, in case of Poland, we have a, despite some kind of setbacks, we have a general Polish-Ukrainian consolation. I believe it's essential uh, in terms like we have a French-German consolation. In a sense, like a French German consolation served as a, a stepping stone for the European unity, in the same way, Polish Ukrainian consolation uh, gives a chance to extend the spirit further east. But now is the question how to extend the spirit toward Russia? And this is the most important question. Yeah. And the question is that so far we haven't had any Russian gatherings, so to say. And this is something that we have to take into account when talking about discussion. I probably will take some sharp, sharp other points, some kind of conclusions that are uh, coming from this uh, my short speech, but I will do it in spare time. If I think it. we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Also, yeah, let's give it a round of applause. Also, just alluding to, since you mentioned the um, French-German re relationship, and we talked about the human factor in all this, beyond politics, just the holding hands by Mitterrand and Kohl back then, was a powerful symbol. I admit that back then I smiled at it. And now I see the resonance of that kind of public gesture, as was, uh, what was the president's, the Lithuanian president's name, Batsakauskas, no? When he was in Israel in 95, and he recognized Lithuanian responsibility for the killing of Jews. And that was a very courageous gesture as was um, Willy Brandt's falling to his knees in 97, and 70, in 1970 in Warsaw. So we have powerful personal gestures carrying a message that is important. Okay, so let's move on um, to Howard Varney, if you want, and fill us in on South African state of affairs, please. Yours is the floor. Thank you, Paul, <clears throat> and as promised, I have my time for five minutes. Uh, but if I exceed the five, please, please intervene. Um, so I'm, I'm first going to tackle the issue that was posed to us. You know, it, uh, is there a definition, an acceptable definition of, of reconciliation? Um, I, I suspect that in, in the global sense, it probably isn't a, a viable definition of reconciliation. If I were to turn to my own country, South Africa, we had an act called the Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act. It set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Clause one was a set of definitions. It defined human rights violations. It defined reparations and various other concepts. But it was entirely silent on reconciliation. It simply wasn't listed. And correctly so, because if there was an attempt to put into the law what reconciliation was, it would then deny South Africans of going on that journey to discover what reconciliation meant for them. So I'm in complete agreement with what Monica said uh, earlier today, that this is not really a state-run initiative, but it's, it really happens at the interpersonal level. Of course, the state has a role to play in offering a framework for a safe and secure uh, process, uh, but frankly, the state shouldn't get involved in, 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 in the content and certainly not up front uh, defining that content. We're probably on safer grounds defining what reconciliation is not, and I can leave that to your own uh, imagination. Uh, so to my mind, peace negotiations, that doesn't for me count uh, as reconciliation. It's really what follows uh, the making of peace as opposed to the, uh, to the peacemaking. Uh, in my field, transitional justice, we tend to talk about uh, reconciliation at different levels, national reconciliation, community reconciliation, and individual reconciliation. So when it comes to national reconciliation, we sometimes suggest that this means uniting behind common goals. Now, in my own country, South Africa, we were blessed with really visionary leaders such as uh, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and of course, uh, the, the late great Nelson Mandela, um, individuals like that laid the path for us. Um, 
Mandela and Tutu engaged in very powerful acts of symbolism, you know, using sport uh, and culture. Mandela reached out to other communities. You know, he donned the Springbok jersey at, at the World Cup final, a Springbok jersey that was associated largely with white people, white Afrikaners. Uh, and to do so when there was only one black person in the team was an incredibly powerful statement. Um, I was asked the question over breakfast, actually, you know, did these people contribute? Could we have done it without them? And I think I've come to the conclusion that I don't think we could have. At the end of the day, it's people who make or break these processes. And if you have the wrong people in, in those positions, they will break the process, in, in my view. The other facet of national reconciliation, which is key, is, is wide public participation. So we've seen in South Africa, but also in places like Tunisia and East Timor, uh, wide participation in discussing what kind of transition do we want. In South Africa and Kenya and elsewhere, where we've been making new constitutions, we've reached out. Tens of thousands of people have been involved in helping to shape the new constitution. Turning to community re reconciliation, in some respects, this is where the real action happens, particularly where the state is not, is not that effective or where conditions on the ground um, might still be hostile. So, for example, in, in Libya, um, there's no prospect of national reconciliation taking place, but we have seen some interesting communi community reconciliation happening at the local level between communities um, and, 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 and within communities. And they're beginning to weave a fabric of reconciliation across those communities. Finally, turning to individual reconciliation, given I only have 39 seconds left. Um, I, I can take 40, thank you. So, you know, South Africa is quite famous for these encounters between individuals, between perpetrators and, and, and victims. Um, but I want to argue against the transactional approach to reconciliation at, at the victim level. And we, we've seen how there's been an attempt in, in countries like Tunisia, uh, Nepal and Indonesia of legalizing the, the process of, of setting out in law when reconciliation happens. In, uh, in Indonesia, they took it to the absurd uh, proposition of saying individuals can only reconcile, there's, there's my alarm, can only reconcile um, if they forgive uh, their perpetrators and only then do they qualify for, for reparations. I'm happy to say that the Constitutional Court struck that down. And, and my final point, if, if I may, Paul, um, is this question around preconditions. In my field of transitional justice, you often hear that you can't have reconciliation unless there's justice. You can't have reconciliation unless the truth is placed on the table, or reparations, or for that matter, institutional reforms. Uh, if you uh, adopt that approach, you uh, disempower those who should be involved in reconciliation, and you relegate it to technicians like investigators, prosecutors, officials, and, and policymakers, which would be unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> Ernest Vecischkiewicz, um, you have something to say you told me before, and who you'll... Uh, rush with it, right? <laughs> right, let me, let me turn on my stopwatch as well uh, and be brutal. Uh, probably you're asking yourself what, what the institution I had actually does, and I, will, I can elaborate on that later on, but first I would like to focus on the question posed by, by the moderator. How do, how do I see the reconciliation? And I will do some I will put some conditions that I see are important, and especially in the context of my own practice in this, in this institution. This is not a scholar kind of definition. Uh, so I'd, I'd rather, I, I think about reconciliation in mostly on common sense, in common sense understanding of the term. Although, although I know there are lots of scientific efforts to define it, but let's put it this way, a very, uh, it's just about restoring relatively friendly relations uh, after the traumas of war, crimes, atrocities. And through, and this is the second, condition, second issue, making particular views of the past relatively compatible with each other. And I put emphasis on the word relatively, because there's the, this debate whether reconciliation can be treated as a goal or, or, or is it a process. I'm all myself in the process camp. So 
uh, we cannot even define a reconciliation as a goal, but it's, it will lead to uh, rather a failure by definition. It's just to, it's a never ending story, especially when you have very deep traumas, uh, especially when you have traumas between two nations or societies. It's a bit different when you have some, some problems within the society. Uh, but there are some, issues, some conditions that I think are necessary. And uh, you can put them in a certain continuum, but I will, I will just briefly touch upon them. Uh, I think that we need to have both material and symbolic gestures and actions by the states. Uh, almost everyone today was saying that it's about people. Yes, people are necessary, but I would like to emphasize the states, when it comes to international reconciliations, are also necessary actors. And if you do not have investment by the state, by the elite, uh, by the governments, then I'm not sure if the process will work out. So I think we should not leave state aside, especially this is my experience with Polish-Russian relations. Uh, so those conditions are very simple. Truth-telling, uh, which helps us to, to do a, some sort of honest introspection, to look into the mirror. And voluntary admission of responsibility, uh, and some readiness for penance, and reconciliation is mostly asymmetrical, which is a problem, because there's always a victim, a perpetrator. We would like to put them both on the weight and try both, both, both of them to acknowledge some sins of the past. It happens, but generally, there is a victim, there is a perpetrator, and it should be clearly stated. And, th and, and uh, two minutes left, so four, Four uh, factors that I believe for, for characteristics of reconciliation events or gestures or symbols that I find important when it comes to this interstate um, signaling uh, that are important to make this reconciliation efforts credible. Uh, first, they, mu they must be costly in terms of political costs. You have to invest your credibility. You have to go against the tide. You have to go against your um, um, constituencies sometimes. It has to be costly. Then it, it, it becomes credible. It has to be voluntary. It cannot be sort of a bargaining issue. It has to be voluntary, not under pressure. It has to be novel in the sense that you have to feel a sort of radical dramatic change. Uh, and it's, and, 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 and uh, uh, in order to, to convince your, the other part that, that it is the real, um, the, the real uh, effort to, to move forward. And also important is it, it should be in some way irrevocable. You invest so much in these efforts that at some point it's, it just sort of cascade uh, uh, appears. It, you cannot pull back because you invested so much in those efforts. And if you get to this point, then it, 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 it might end up uh, with a success. In Polish-Russian relations, it didn't. And I can elaborate it on later on. So thanks. I did it. Five Thank minutes. you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, a round of applause. Now, I, have, I seem to have created the impression that the most important thing about this reunion today or anything we'll do in these three days is keep time. This is not so. This is not what I first have in mind, okay? <laughs> but I'm glad that all participants here work with me on this. Thank you. Um, are there any questions among the four of you, including Professor Ritzak in Lviv, um, things you would like to comment briefly on each other's contributions? Because I have a question or two before we do our second round, but I don't want to... Please, please, Ernest. But very brief, uh, about humiliation, you mentioned. Uh, the question, humiliation, yeah. that Macron and, uh, mentioned. And uh, I have a problem with this. Uh, how can we uh, today discuss this question when the war is going on? And what, uh, how can we humiliate the state, actually? I mean, uh, so if you could elaborate, how, how do you feel, given, given the historical precedence, what, what Macron did have in mind when, when he, and, and all those people who are to, to speaking put us about up to date all, we're talking about not humiliating Putin, right? This is the concept. Am I right in understanding? Good. 
Okay. Well, I think we're, we're talking um, about the extraordinary challenge, uh, don't get me wrong, the extraordinary challenge of making peace a peace that both sides can live with. And one of those preconditions is probably that the other side does not have the impression that five years down the line, there will be a revenge war, which is kind of a recurring uh, experience in European history. And there are relatively few exceptions um, to that general rule. And one would have been the, um, the, the, the Congress of Vienna, where France was at the negotiation table as an equal partner, and they agreed on a European security order that more or less lasted until the beginning of the First World War, so nearly a century with some exceptions. Um, now, of course, the big difference is that these kind of cabinet wars were made by a few elite politicians before the um, age of mass politics. So these days, any politician who might suggest that from the U on the Ukrainian side would probably not get re-elected. Re you know, it's much harder for democracies to make peace than for dictatorships or royal states where the king says, well, we're going to make peace now, and then, you know, the armies are sent home. Um, for democracies, it's a much bigger challenge, and the, the peacemakers in Paris realized that as well because they were under enormous pressure, right? The French and the British publics did not want the kind of peace treaty without victors that Woodrow Wilson had suggested, but it was easy for him to suggest because America had only just entered the war, they didn't have the same kind of casualties. Um, <clears throat> and it's easy for me to say, of course, I'm you know, sitting here in, uh, in Dublin and I'm not sitting uh, in Ukraine at the moment, where of course there will be emotional resistance against the idea that after the Russian troops have been hopefully expelled, um, one should stretch out the hand and try to negotiate um, a prolonged peace, which is even more complicated because, we already mentioned this, this is not just an interstate war, there's a, a civil war element, at least in eastern Ukraine, which further complicates the process, which is why I referenced both the um, Congress of Vienna on the one hand and the Good Friday Agreement as two kind of peace agreements. Can we, can we just carry on um, with you, Professor Gerwart, to... Um, this is thing that interested me when, of course, I know your track record as a war historian, and when we talked about this earlier, that war history is not very popular um, because it has a like a tinge of something unpleasant, as if you wanted war, as if you liked war. Military history is even more unpleasant. Can you tell us a little, I think, because it's interesting now, with, with this war going on against the Ukraine, what has happened to your profession? Are you more en vogue? People ask you, you know, fill us in on, you know, how to understand what's going on? Yeah, I suppose as someone who works on Europe in the period of the two, two world wars, um, I was a sort of slightly exotic uh, creature for quite some time because war appeared to be something that was no longer happening uh, in Europe. And it has unfortunately become very fashionable, so I certainly get you know, a lot of phone calls these days. Can you please kind of um, offer some you know, historical context on armed conflict in, in European history? And I'm very happy to do that, but of course I, I could have done without it. Uh, uh, understandably, I'm, I don't believe, I, I'm not studying war because I enjoy it, so I think that's a very common uh, misunderstanding as if, you know, I mean, d doctors do not practice medicine because they enjoy disease, because they want to understand it, right? So um, that's, that's uh, I, I think, important to bear in mind. So I think military historians have had a, a bad reputation for the wrong reasons um, for quite some time. But yeah, of course, I mean, it, cha it, it, it makes it more, um, it makes the subject matter, unfortunately, more topical than most of us would have liked, obviously. Um, all of a sudden, you know, the... Um, understanding intercommunity violence as well as um, the, the origins of interstate wars, all of that has become something that the general public is, is becoming more interested in. But you can also see it, I mean, if you look at student populations, for example, um, because of my specialization, I primarily teach the history of the two world wars, right? Um, but to my, my students who are 18 or 19, 
I may as well be teaching the Middle Ages. It seemed so far away, so distant, fortunately, uh, to many of them who have grown up without, well, even without parents, in some cases even grandparents who have experienced war uh, in Europe. Um, and all of a sudden, I think people are probably coming to those lectures for other reasons, because they want to understand the dynamics of war. Um, and hopefully also the dynamics of making peace. It's much easier to start a war than to, to make peace. I think that's important. And to understand that um, uh, making peace, we talked about making peace being a process rather a moment in time, and I entirely agree with that. Um, but it's also, I think it's important to understand that it doesn't just require you know, putting the tanks, uh, removing them from, from the scene, but it also requires the demobilization of mines, which is a much more complicated um, and, and drawn out process, as many of those working in the field of reconciliation will be fully aware. Okay, thank you so much. Professor Ritzak, um, we have many questions for you, but you want to add something or ask or comment upon. I would like to comment this argument of Putin that Macron did on Malaysian. I believe this is a rather an illusion. The thing is that we are talking rather about peace or armistice, but not reconciliation. In my deep understanding, because understanding my Ukrainian college scholars as well, you could not and you should not reconcile with Putin, so to say, because it's possible, it's impossible. As they say, it takes two to tango, and Putin doesn't want to dance. He doesn't accept the language of the reconciliation, but the language of reconciliation is the language of weaklings, so to say. And this is the, the, the main problem. Yes, reconciliation with Russia that we very much has in mind, and we're planning that, but not with Putin. It's very much like a French-German reconciliation. Who would think about French-German reconciliation under Hitler? The first precondition, entry ticket, that Hitler has to go or Putin has to go. We are thinking probably with somebody like Navalny or his ilk or the next generation. But, but basically I'm saying it's not about reconciliation, about peace and armistice, rather to say. And the second, second thing, that it's not reconciliation, it's not an event, it's a process. At least we have to start it somewhere. And again, as I said, I believe in this sense, what matters is the initiative of society and mostly intellectuals or public intellectuals or, or church leaders. Because in my understanding, this my impression is, state call, always came late. It's a latecomer in the reconciliation because something has to start kind of dialogue within society. As pathetic as it sounds, but it's basically true. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up thing about um you remember that, that some of Putin's words were questioning um, the nationhood of Ukraine. And that was very much commented upon, and now they're, they're appearing histories of Ukraine uh, showing that along a number of centuries there is um, an idea of a Ukrainian nation and there's a history to prove it. Could you comment upon what's happening now? Is this going to strengthen the idea of nationhood in the Ukraine? and a sense of unity of a, as a democratic country that wants to be in Europe? I would say very much so. There has been large consensus among Ukrainians about their independence. So for sure, Ukrainians are fighting on many issues, especially historical memory, Second World War. And this is something when they badly themselves need reconciliation to be reconciled. But a part of that, when it comes to idea independence, whatever there will be a referendum on independence, there will always be results will be positive. And the more positive, more intense this support when the Ukrainians feel some kind of the outside uh, danger, threat. And this, uh, I would just say, just give you one example, that the highest support to Ukraine independence was during under, uh, uh, Crimean annexation. So what I'm saying, there has been such, some, some consensus, but what Putin did is strengthen this consensus. So what I'm telling that, that basically those elements of civil war practically disappeared. And if you look specifically on those most eastern large metropolis like Kharkiv and Odessa, they've been very much on the Russian-speaking, pro-Russian side. Nowadays, not anymore. And this is you've seen on the uh, uh, initiative of the local authority, which is very much the anti-Maidan authority, when they now themselves initiated removing some Russian names from the streets and uh, from, the, from the monuments. So this is something I believe that, in a sense, Putin, Putin put an end to Ukrainian civil war. Thank you so much. So let's move on um, to, like, we're deeply in the second round before we um, 
can um, also listen to the audience and ask uh, or listen to their questions. Howard, is there anything you want to say to deepen what you just started about South Africa or take up any of what was said before? You pick. If you don't pick, I have a question for you, but... There is a thing that when we, um, Howard Varney referred earlier to breakfast, that was us having a prolonged two hour breakfast and talking about South Africa, or I was listening and he was talking. Uh, and it was kind of, let's say, depressing to know that uh, something that is so symbolical in the world, which is the um, end of apartheid and the process of, you know, rainbow state, new society and these huge symbolic figures of Mandela and Desmond Tutu, um, that this kind of evaporated over the years and that society has not kept the promise, if you want, that was given in the 90s. Could you enlarge upon why this, in your view, failed? Yes. Um, and I'm sorry that this morning was, was one-way traffic. It was but, wonderful. Uh, but, it was but, absolutely but, wonderful. That's why I'm here. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, w w once you get me going, as, as you, you know, mentioned, there's, there's, there's no turning back. Um, and it's interesting that, that, that you talk about, you know, the miracle of the, of the Rainbow Nation, which, of course, that phrase was made quite famous by, by Desmond Tutu. And, and in some respects, it, it, it was a miracle because, you know, we, today we do have a functioning democracy uh, based on a constitution which has the respect of most South Africans. It's enforceable uh, in the courts. So in, in, in that sense, we move from uh, a, a nation based on oppression and racial discrimination to, to one based on um, values that I think most people in the world could subscribe to. One has to put it in context, though. Our transition was in some, um, uh, you know, one has to consider what happened following the release of Nelson Mandela in 1990. And in the years that, that led up to our democratic elections in 94, those were the most violent years of South Africa's modern history. More people died violently in political violence in those five odd years than in, in all the years um, leading up to um, those negotiations. So it was a pretty violent time. And it, you know, Nelson Mandela, on many occasions, walked away from the negotiations because the state wasn't intervening in, in that violence. So it wasn't exactly a, a seamless, uh, non-violent uh, process. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we had the celebrated Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We had this famous Truth for Amnesty process in which individuals were invited to come forward, disclose the truth, and then claim their, their amnesty. Um, and a few thousand did, 7,000 applied and around 700 were granted amnesty. At the end of that process, some South Africans, particularly those in leadership positions, decided that enough was enough and it was time to walk away from uh, the transition. What we're beginning to learn in South Africa, as well as in many other transitions, is, is that perhaps we, we're using the long word because transition suggests that this is a, a short-term process. Are we talking about a few months, a few years, perhaps at the outside five, ten years? But I think what we're finding is that, in fact, these transitions are, are, are generational. Maybe we need to come up with a new term because um, in South Africa, we're still going through this transition more than 20 years later. And I suspect this project will go on for, for many years to come. But if I were to look at the downside, to be realistic, on the one hand, you know, we, we can claim proudly that we've offered something of a model. And we heard from Monica that the South African model was very inspiring for, for her and her colleagues in in, in Northern Ireland. But after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Archbishop Desmond Tutu handing over um, uh, the, the multi-volume report, I think it's true to say that the South African state, and when I talk about the South African state, I'm talking about headed by the African National Congress, the party that led the liberation struggle, it effectively turned its back on the victims, the very victims that had, in many cases, given their you know, blood, sweat, and tears, and lives for uh, this democracy and the enshrined freedoms. Um, we were meant to see, for example, um, justice. In those cases where individuals didn't apply for amnesty or they were refused amnesty, that never materialized. Not only 
that did not happen. We've discovered an unholy conspiracy uh, that was hatched to suppress those cases. The Truth Commission handed nearly 400 uh, murder cases dealing with assassinations, uh, massacres and the like to the prosecutors. Virtually none of them have been taken forward and we now know why, because there was a, a plan hatched to suppress those, those cases. Sorry, Howard, just a brief question to understand this better. 400 murder cases, these are the only ones brought forward or brought to justice or... I mean, there must have been thousands. Well, there, there, there were thousands and, and the Truth Commission um, dealt with around 20,000 cases. But in terms of handing over cases that could be taken forward, they, they um, highlighted 400 odd cases. So these would represent many others not heard? Indeed, you know, there were thousands of, of, of other cases in which amnesty was also denied. But in these cases, these were cases in which there was evidence available, which the families wanted justice, um, and which the commission decided to hand over a particular list of cases uh, to, to the prosecutors. I indeed, it was open to the prosecutors to go outside that list, um, which, which of course hasn't happened because they haven't even taken those cases forward. This has been tr quite traumatic for the families and communities involved because they compromised. You know, they went into this process in good faith. Um, th many didn't want to, in fact. They, they, they felt that they needed justice and truth from the outset. But most of the families and the communities decided to make this historical compromise for the greater good. So justice has been denied. Adequate reparations has been denied. We estimate that around 100,000 individuals have been denied reparations. Um, so South Africa still has a, a long way to go. Um, and sadly, uh, the state led by the party that, as I said, you know, led this liberation struggle from what we are, have witnessed over the last 25 odd years, they've turned their backs on the very people uh, who made it possible. And that has left a very bitter taste and has undermined the reconciliation project. Thank you so much, Howard. Also for deconstructing, um, um, the, it's a kind of a myth that, that we like to believe in uh, out of sheer distance to South Africa. We like to believe this is going on and all will be well. It is not so. Um, now, Ernest, if you want to um, go deeper into what you started, also what you told me about how it started out with Polish-Russian reconciliation opening of the archives, I would be glad you told us something about okay. like that. Uh, but first, let me just do a little footnote to this your debate about uh, military historians. Uh, I think that it, 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 it is an exotic creature maybe in Western academia, but not in Poland, not in the region, and at least as far as I know, I have a lot of friends in Poland, actually historians who deal mostly with conflicts and history and war. So it tells also a lot about uh, the difference of perceptions on the level of societies when it comes to this war and the role of education. The differences in education systems here and in our region also might have impact on the way how we perceive what has been happening in, in Ukraine today. Uh, so Polish, Poland, Russia. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it reconciliation, the whole process even. It started pretty well. Uh, it started with something new, very new, a truth in Polish-Russian relations because uh, Rybmetrov Mołokov Pact has been released as a, a, and, and admitted by the, by the Soviet authorities at that time that it really happened. Uh, the Katyn massacre documents, not all of them, but Stalin's order was um, uh, become public. Uh, uh, Polish military cementaries were erected uh, to, in Russia, so there was also some material symbols. Uh, it, it lasted for 10 years, maybe, more or less. Uh, it was voluntary, so there was no, it was not under pressure. So Gorbachev, Yeltsin, State Duma, or Supreme, Supreme Soviet under USSR did it without any pressure from outside. So there were some signals that well, something might have really happened, uh, but it was not enough. It was not, I would say, using the categories I mentioned, it was not uh, costly enough for them. It was cheap. The Polish issues were second rank, rather, for, the, for Russian elites. It was very easy 
to do these gestures because it actually didn't lead to any kind of uh, obligations from the society, from the uh, within the Russia. So uh, you have this moment at that time. There is a lot of bottom-up initiatives with memorial as a, as the biggest issue. The people from memorial actually played a huge role when it comes to not just Polish-Russian relations, because this is the minor issue, but generally for the Russians to help them look into the mirror and look at the way how the system actually uh, treated Russians themselves. Uh, but as I said, it lasted for 10 years and, or so. Even President Putin sent some positive signals at the very beginning. Uh, but then Georgia came, then uh, annexation of Crimea, and all those issues or uh, relatively open access to Russian archives, which has never been easy, but at least it was relatively uh, open for uh, researchers from Poland, it abruptly ended in, uh, in just overnight. When? It, 2014, I would say. It was a, it was a decisive year with, uh, with the Russian aggression. Because at that time, actually, because we had a lot of partners, public institutions in Russia. And, and just in a, ma in a month or two, they uh, automatically taken the, 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 the line of the, of the government, all the propaganda, messaging, signaling. So it, it turned out very quickly that you cannot discuss anything with them. In public, nothing. In pr privately, well, it's very, Russians do not like to discuss important issues through your phone or emails. You have to meet with each other. Then you, they can tell you then by the coffee or vodka well, they, what they think really about, about the world. But it's not the, the serious dialogue. It's, it should be something more. And it all just uh, died in a, uh, in, in a couple of years. And the last point that I would like to mention, I think is quite important, and it's very specific and very important for the future of any kind of Polish-Russian uh, conversation. I, I wouldn't call it reconcil reconciliation. Let's leave it after Putin. And uh, is that... After 2014, it became clear, and now it's obvious, that uh, Polish-Russian reconciliation, if it was to be something real, we need to include Ukraine into the picture. A third actor. Normally, you think about bilater in bilateral context, about mutual initiatives, efforts to do this or that. But today, I would say that Polish-Russian future reconciliation is a function of Russian-Ukrainian relations. So if there is no change in Russian policy towards Ukraine in the future, there is not, not a chance for Polish-Russian reconciliation. And this is something that Russians didn't want to admit in, in discussion with us, and this has also led to, to, to the failure, actually, of, of bilateral dialogue. Yeah. Um, Professor Ritzak, you just heard what, what Ernest said. Could you comment upon that before we go and move over to the audience with questions? I would absolutely sign to every word that just has been told, so to say, and I believe that hardly it's possible any reconciliation this region without ukraine russian reconciliation. And uh, there's probably a brief moment which was being not quoted, the brief moment after the Skatin disaster in the April 2010, but there was an attempt of the Polish intelligentsia, Gazette of Borcha. They were believing that there was probably a new era in the relations with Putin coming, but this failed, basically. So again, what I'm telling, we have a very good relations with Poland, and I believe reconciliation, Polish relations, uh, Polish relations is already done. It's not perfect. It's far from being perfect, but it's working. It's more important. So actually, if I may refer this example of the uh, South African reconciliation, and I believe there's some parallel here. Uh, we also have the creation, some kind of creation of Polish-Ukraine relations, especially after, after, after Maidan and Crimea uh, with, the, with the ruling party in Poland. But that said, that said, it doesn't, it wasn't kind of the strategic determination, uh, deterioration, because basically when it comes to the, to the crisis, uh, Poland stand together with Ukraine. So what I'm saying here, I would say there is hardly ideal reconciliation. It's as good, it's a, as, good as it gets, as it goes, so to say. Yes. It is, has some several, several setbacks, but also you have all this work on that. But basically, basic, on the basic level, this reconciliation has been reached. You hardly could imagine a war between Poland and Ukraine. Very much you could hardly imagine war between French and German or French, Polish and German. This is probably a new quality. And we don't have this quality with Russia. No neighbor, practically. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Professor. Now, um, let's open the floor to questions from the audience. I see you there. Can you bring over the mic, please? I don't see anyone. Oh, there's one more here. Let's keep that in mind. Okay. You're number two and number three, OK? The gentleman over there. I'm sorry? One, two, three, OK? Let's take it in that from right to left. Thank you. Uh, Darius Karłowicz, I am a f philosopher from Warsaw. Uh, listening to you and, I mean, being convinced that the problem of reconciliation is crucial, I, uh, I can't stop thinking that about the idea which was supplied by uh, Greeks, uh, the idea of Kairos. We are talking now during a war with Ukraine about the reconciliation. Uh, Professor Marcus told about a future dialogue uh, between Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and Russian. And I have a feeling that maybe the idea which should be considered deeply in Europe now, deeply in Europe, it's the idea of stop conciliation. I have, that, I, I have a feeling that our attitude towards Russian now uh, too deeply involve in the way of thinking which is uncurrent somehow. I mean, now we should think, I mean, Professor Marx is, uh, if I'm not wrong, you are one of Sorry, the persons well, who create. Um, go into a question yeah, to someone that, here? Okay. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's a question. I mean, don't you think that when we, for example, may talk about the problem with supplying uh, in weapons Ukraine, we should consider the idea of stop conciliation, not to be a slave of a, let's say, easy way of thinking that reconciliation is always current idea, it's always on time. Okay, is there anyone here to, yeah. Uh, if I may, just quickly, what, what is my opinion on that? Uh, I think that, uh, Responsibility comes first, reparations come f comes first, and then we can start talking about reconciliation. Reconciliation requires from, from the responsible party to admit, uh, I mean, to, to look into the mirror, to look to your partner and to, to pay the price for what you've done. And the Russian, the Russian state is not ready and able to do that for now, and I believe that under this leadership it is not possible, because uh, Putin himself invested too much into the war to, to, to pull back. Uh, so any idea that we can somehow um, make him more rational in our terms, Western terms, is just a naive thinking. Uh, and that is why I'm, 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 I fully agree with the idea that first we need to defeat him and uh, not humili humiliate him. I don't know what humiliation means in this sense. I, I'm not in Putin's head, but we need to defeat him in this war. And Ukrainians actually need to defeat him and we need to help them. Uh, because otherwise it's not gonna, uh, it's, it, it, will, it will come back sooner than we think, uh, I believe. So responsibility reparations and then somewhere in the future uh, real serious dialogue about reconciliation. Okay, thank you. So number two, over here in the middle someplace. Yeah. I can't see very well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Malcha Storia from Georgia. So uh, I'm a professor of history and a member of the Academic Council of uh, the network. So um, it deeply concerns what the current discussion, and Georgia also was briefly mentioned before the Ukraine, it was kind of a first case when uh, Russia invaded Georgia, and uh, but it was not rather unnoticed and, uh, you know, uncomfortable to uh, to, to the West or, or um, the world that, you know, it, the Putin is a really danger of, of, of the world uh, and peace and whatever we have. Um, I, I would uh, I would go with Professor Christak's argument I, uh, and um, and kind of develop the same uh, line of reasoning. The question would be like a going beyond sort of post-colonial um, approach that Ukrainians were 
or Georgians were deprived of agency. When, for instance, Mishaimer or Macron even or Kissinger were talking about, you know, let's consider the red lines of Putin that, you know, don't humiliate him and, you know, maybe give some territories in order to, you know, uh, end the war. And it, it means that this is sort of ignoring um, former imperial subjects' uh, approach or perspective. You formulate the question. Yeah, yeah, the question. Our yeah, and I, it, it, I would come to the question. So, what would be the precondition? This is maybe all speakers may address this. Uh, and partially it was answered like a, not negotiating with Putin, but Putin is gone and. Um, and uh, recognizing agency of, of former Soviet or post-imperial kind of uh, people in order to you know, begin something with this uh, new page. Uh, how how sh do you uh, see these what uh, the next preconditions? Step, yeah. What the next step should be? Yeah, or what the next you, step? OK, yeah. is there anything? Uh, Professor Blitzak, perhaps you, what you advise, um, the question was, you know, what should Ukraine wisely do, I think? This is the way I, I took the question. Am I right? Oh, yes. Uh, am I, am I, this I'm, seems to be too frozen. You're you good, you're good. We can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, thank you. So, uh, I do agree with my Georgian colleague. I believe that the, the, the basic precondition is the admitting the border of 1991. I mean, first of all, Russia has to reconcile its, its own border of 1991 border, claim no territory outside this border, like they did in Georgia or Moldavia or in nowadays, nowadays in Ukraine. This is exactly what the Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation about, that borders are not just, but we are not touching them. Because once we touch them, we have this a new war. So this was basic for reconciliation, which was very costly on the both sides, because both sides have territorial pretension to each other. So first of all, defeat Putin, not to humiliate Russians. This is definitely we, we, if Macron would put it not to humiliate Russians, that would agree, but not defeat, not about defeating the, the humiliation of Putin. So first of all, you have to respect the kind of dignity of Russians without a doubt to start this meaningful dialogue. But precondition for this dialogue, you have to respect the borders of 1991. Okay, and then for you. sure we could have a kind of further dialogue, which will have a kind of historical truth, reconciliation, talking about who is to blame and give this kind of formula, forgive us and we forgive you, all the kind of things that we have. But the, this could be the further steps. But the first steps will be Putin has to go. Secondly, Russia has to Russia has to accept the borders without humiliations of Russian so to say. Can I can I follow up briefly because this is on my mind. It has been on my mind quite a while, and it, I'm sure it's on the mind of many. Um, it's not very probable that that Russian troops will recede into Russia, and they will not not give up what they won um, in 1914. Um, how would you advise on that? So basically, we don't talk, we talk about uh, Ukrainian or NATO offense to Moscow. What we expect, and this is what I believe expectations of many experts, that there will be collapse of the Putin regime, not collapse of Russia, Putin collapse of Russian regime. And once this regime collapsed, you could start meaningful negotiations. Um, have we all understood that? That was the collapse of the Russian regime? Yeah. Co of Putin. Of Putin regime. Oh, Collapse and are you, Putin, are you hopeful? I'm um, sorry if I keep asking you, but are you hopeful um, concerning a change of regime in Russia? Can you do you expect something better than we have now? Yeah, I do believe that, uh, in a sense, what Putin started war against Ukraine and signed this would shorten his, so to say, the time span. And this is the belief of many experts, both including Russian liberal experts. They believe that sanctions will start work sooner or later. And also giving the not very impressive track of, of Russian uh, army in, 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 in uh, Ukraine, because the, the fronts are changing, but very slowly, not the expectations of Putin. So what will, uh, what will have, have probably effect on 1991? I mean, the Putin would lose his legitimacy 
and it would get to collapse of his regime, not to collapse of Russia, but his regime and the change to his regime. Okay. And then, then we could start some kind of negotiations and reconciliation. Thank you. So, um, yes, the gentleman over here, you have the mic. Thank you very much, Gregor Christians, Maya Mercato Fellow in International Affairs. Since this is the concepts panel, so to say, I would be interested in a more general grid. So you, all of you are already mentioning actors in the respective reconciliation processes. Uh, but maybe you could um, try as a panel, as individuals, to um, identify main actors for these reconciliation processes, singling out the importance of individuals, collective actors, public institutions, or also courts. Maybe there's other actors that I haven't mentioned, but just for um, having a systemized approach to this concept of reconciliation or these various concepts of reconciliation, I think this would be an interesting point to talk about. I understand you, you want us to name certain yeah, exactly. people, institutions. Exactly, to develop some kind of actual grid. Okay, why don't we just start here with Howard and then we move on. Uh, just name somebody or some institution that could be propagating reconciliation. But, um, Paul, is this at the geopolitical level in relation to you know, European conflicts, Ukraine, Russia, or Actually, are we talking about... Uh, in general, in general, okay. right? If you have, we have examples for figures or institutions, okay. Right, well, that, that's quite a difficult question for me, so I'm probably going to have to defer it. Um, but but as, as I said at the beginning of, of my address, um, I, I'm not persuaded that these efforts to engineer a peace deal uh, can be described as, as reconciliation. I mean, we all know who the actors are in, in, in that process. Um, you know, to, to, to my mind, the real work of reconciliation really only starts once that peace deal has been struck. And, and that's about building, you know, uh, f future relations. It's about building a better future. Uh, my experience really comes from working within countries uh, where you want to bring stakeholders and, and, and groups together, um, and, and at times individuals. But then you have to look at that particular context uh, to work out, you know, who, who, who's best. Uh, with, without being exclusive, you know, reconciliation really has to be Time, uh, inclusive. For not naming names, you're very long. <laughs> yeah. uh, when it comes to the reconciliation, I look at it from the, let's say, uh, natural sciences perspective, rather. So it is sort of an emergent characteristic. Emergent, I mean that you have sort of uh, a lot of network institutions, states, public opinion makers, journalists, uh, uh, education system that do something. and. At a so, certain point, and you cannot even sh put it exactly in time, it reaches a new level. A sort of new emergent quality uh, appears suddenly, and you suddenly you can you check the opinion, uh, public opinion polls, and you see that well. Somehow we trust each other more than we trusted ten years ago, uh, and something like that happened in Polish-German relations. But obviously, it needed a lot of investment. And it's not, and this process, this process hasn't ended. It's still ongoing. So I would rather look at this, at this process this way. I cannot point to any kind of specific body or institution. Yeah, I mean, instead of uh, just talking about institutions, I think that economic um, circumstances obviously also uh, matter greatly. So I mean, the more prosperous a society is, the more likely it becomes that reconciliation becomes possible because people have simply other interests and uh, other opportunities uh, to live different lives than if they're caught up in a kind of a permanent uh, downward spiral of economic crisis, um, which in turn encourages nationalism, etc., as we know. Um, but I mean, one, we've been talking quite rightly, of course, uh, a lot about Putin's regime. And now one particular, I think, obstacle to reconciliation we didn't talk much about, and that's, you know, what are you, what are, even in the case of a full military um, liberation of all of Ukrainian uh, territory, what are you going to do with the pro-Russian separatists? Um, I mean, that's a question that I, I cannot answer, but I mean, they're the real um, issue, really, longer term in terms of inner societal reconciliation, because um, it's much easier to end 
interstate wars than it is to end civil wars. And, you know, looking at the historical models um, of the 20th century, none of them are good, right? That sounds difficult. Professor Ritzak, um, do you have a name or an institution, or are you also a theorist? I couldn't provide the whole list, so to say, but I would just, uh, the name, uh, institution which is missing so far our discussion, this is the church. There is a professor, Jose Casanova, probably know, who is specialist in religious studies nowadays on modernity, and he basically claims, if you look in the French German consolation, or Polish German consolation, Catholic dimension was very much present there as well as the case of the South, South African relation with Desmond Tutu. Also, our own experience, Polish economic translation, without Polish church, without John Paul II, it would hardly happen. And the dialogue between two churches, Ukrainian church and the Polish church. Because there is something which Václav Havel once referred by then his life. Because he basically need what, what, is, what we needed in, in Europe nowadays is a kind of uh, political metaphysics, or metaphysical politics, so to say. Just we have to be aware of what we're sacrificing our, so to say, interest in name of what. And this name must be something very, really kind of the broader than just our personal interest, interest of the state. So this is something I believe which is very important, it must be there. Chair dimension must be there. And one, I believe, one of the obstacles uh, of the, of the Russian Ukrainian consolation that Russian church is too, too close uh, is, is, too, is too close to the state, so to say. Therefore, it's basically articulating state, state, state position. And also that said, I believe that, again, I might be wrong, but this is very my subjective feeling. I believe that uh, reconciliation is a relatively modern concept. It's emerged in the post-war uh, Europe and was very, very much, very much uh, limited, so to say. So just, again, what I'm saying here, just judge as historian, intellectuals first, then probably somehow, somehow, in some ways, legitimized by the church, this kind of political metaphysics. And then, then institutions for sure, but mostly state. As, I, as my experience says, state is comes, comes not first, but at the very final moment of the reconciliation. Yeah, this you. must be some kind of programmatic statement. Why are we reconciling? Why? What is the reason for reconciliation? What is the stake of the kind of things? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid the Russian Orthodox Church is not really a case in point for what you just said. But that has to do with the deep connections uh, of the. Uh, but we, we believe we believe everything could change. Even rational talk change could change. Yeah, no. <laughs> so you didn't wisely didn't include uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, um, for I think good good reasons. Um, let me just say uh, I'm a simple mind, and before we wrap up here, let me just say that I do have a hero here. And that is just simply, it's one of the great stories of the 21st century, in my view, that a former actor becomes president in such a fashion. First, second, he stays on. He is a model to his people. And I'm, as I say, uh, just looking at representatives, um, he's outstanding. And I wish him all the luck. So uh, thank you so much to all of you here, Professor Ritzak in Lviv. Um, please keep well. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you for listening. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you. So we will now make a 20 minute break, almost 20, and meet here at 6 for turbo presentations. <laughs>
questions because every of our speakers has, uh, has exactly 90 seconds to tell about its institution or idea or project. We'll see like multiple um, presentations, interesting presentations today. And uh, so I will ask our panelists or guests to move a little bit forward, to not see it in the very last row, uh, because you won't have much time to you know, come to the stage. And the thing is that uh, we, will, we will start, like all the presentations are put into alphabetic order, so we do not discriminate anyone. We start with the uh, yeah, alphabetic order. And the thing is that, just to uh, tell you a, a little bit, you will all, so you send your presentations to our colleague who will put them on the, on the screen, but you will have the remote controller to change the slides. You can also press the button here to point, but I'm not sure if you will have time for this. However, I put a special instruction for you how to do it. So if you are not familiar with remote controls anymore, uh, this is the instruction how to, how to do it. And first, and I also would like, I think that it will be easier for you to stay, uh, to stand here at the lecturer. I will be like somewhere close. And I think that uh, it's time to introduce and invite the first person. So uh, Gregor Christian Mayer from the Fellowship of, of, on International Affairs from Germany. Thank you very much. The Western Balkans are a region where history is still very divisive. Young people are confronted with rather negative historical narratives about other ethnicities and their families, societies, and schools. I will suggest five aspects for international youth exchange on history topic that can be successful for the Western Balkans and beyond. First, preparation both acquiring knowledge about one's own history and emotional preparation, especially when visiting historical signs of crimes against humanity, are key to success. Second, authentic places. If all groups get to know a new location and visit history, historical sites, youth encounters become as special sustainable. Third, active creative appropriation. When history is approached on a personal level, creative translation into a film, an exhibition or similar can make the international learning process particularly fruitful. Fourth, references to the present. By involving experts like conspiracy theories in past and present, broader historical education can be achieved. Fifth, focus on understanding and remembering. Youth encounters must not persuade participants to gestures of reconciliation. Today's youth does not have direct responsibility for their ancestors' actions, but they can learn from and with each other. On this level, joint remembrance becomes possible. I'm happy if there are people interested in further exchange. Thank you for giving me the stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Almost on time, 95 seconds, thank you very much. And now I would like to um, invite the second person. Uh, it's Mr. Uh, Hubert Hudio from the Center for Documentation of Deportations, Explosions and Resettlements of the Pedagogical University of Krakow. Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my, my name is Hubert Kujo. I, I am director of the Center for Documentation of Deportation, Expulsions and Resettlements, which is a part of the Pedagogical University of Krakow. The main goal of uh, our center is to save from oblivion the fate of inhabitants of the Second Polish Republic, who in the past faced forced migrations. Uh, in general, our center consists uh, of uh, a research institute, a museum, a library, and an archive. One of the most important parts of uh, our activity is interviewing witnesses of history. Now we have more than 1,000 interviews in our collection. We interview survivors uh, in Krakow, generally in Poland and also abroad. During uh, interviews, people give us private photographs, documents, artifacts, which we store in the archives in the museum. Based uh, on the interviews and documents, we prepare exhibition 
publish books, make movies, we also do scientific research and organize academic conferences. Historical education plays a very important role in our activity. That's why we do organize student workshop and various meeting with survivors. The other part of center activity are documentation and renovation uh, of the Polish refugee cemeteries in uh, the East and South Africa. Our center was honored by multiple uh, awards and prizes. prizes. Thank you for your attention and I invite you to our center in Krakow. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Hudio. And now, oh, okay, there are still some slides here. Okay, yeah, yeah, so now, now we would like to, um, yeah, thank you very much. And now we would like to uh, invite uh, Ms. Uh, Mari Januszkova from Czech Republic and from the organization Postbellum. Um, okay. We would like to ask for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just click the first like, button. I don't know if yeah. you should point over there. Uh, I will maybe wait I a bit, but okay. Yeah, I can ask our technical support for the presentation behind the scenes. Okay, okay I think perfect. we have it. Thank you. Good afternoon. So Postbellum is an NGO established in Prague, and for more than 20 years we have been collecting testimonies of the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, but unfortunately also of the 21st century. So we have recorded in the last years more than 12,000 testimonies, and we are publishing them in the publicly accessible online archive. We are conducting interviews also in the countries as Belarus and Cuba, and we are, of course, open to international cooperation. So please contact us, contact me. So uh, our main focus is to bring these precious memories into the public, and we award uh, people who were acting bravely dur during the communism and nazism. Uh, we uh, organize uh, exhibitions and educational activities and our long-term goal was to establish a museum of the 20th century what we finally did at the beginning of this year in Pardubice this is a town close to Prague and uh, we are uh, you can walk in the shoes of a chosen witness in this exposition by the end I would also like to mention our help through COVID to the people who shared their memories with us and very important part, as documentarists, we could not just uh, watch to the situation in Ukraine, and we have collected over 13 million euro to the help uh, to the Ukrainian defenders, and started as documentarists uh, producing bulletproof vest. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. And now, not yet. I I think uh, now you are, uh, sorry, Mr. But I think now we have, uh, it's like alphabetic order, and now we have Antonia Tony Jolik, sorry, fifth, okay, from, uh, from the Monash Art, Design and Architecture. Good, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Tony Jolik. I'm from Melbourne, Australia, in case you're wondering where the accent is from. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work out in your countries, you can always migrate to Australia. I want to talk about the e-memoriam project which I'm currently doing with the Homeland War Museum in Dubrovnik. So my PhD investigation is essentially about how participatory design can actually aid in navigating cultural memory in Croatia to do with the Croatian War of Independence. So it's not necessarily European, it's more local. So I'm currently researcher in residence at the Dubrovnik Muse Museum in Dubrovnik, and I have the city of Dubrovnik, the archives of Dubrovnik, and also the University of Dubrovnik students as participants in this particular project. Um, those of you that are very academically oriented, this is the design framework that I'm actually working on, which is part of my PhD investigation. So I'm actually using the project to test that. It's got four different phases, 
At, at the moment, I'm in exploratory phase, so I'm basically doing participatory design workshops with Croatian youth to determine the theme. Because what we find in Croatia at the moment, it seems like the communists have taken the moral high ground again. And what seems to be a very important historical period in the country is very much neglected. In other words, the national cultural memory strategy in Croatia is very weak. So essentially, I'm testing this through a project. Um, I just wanted to briefly talk about the museum. Um, it's been around since 2016. As any museum, it actually has a very vast collection of that particular period of Croatian War of Independence. And it has a permanent exhibition. In case you're ever in Dubrovnik, it's on a mountain just behind the old city. Um, and I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And now I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Nikos Kosmidis from the Action, Actions for History, Memory and Culture. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, sorry for taking the floor before. Uh, our project maybe is the youngest that has been presented uh, until now uh, because it was only founded uh, last September. Uh, although the roots go back to 2005, the first time I visited uh, Auschwitz. So the idea behind our project, uh, and we run the project together with the foundation of Thracian art and uh, tradition, is to examine um, history through space and how memories are conveyed uh, through space. So you will see we are doing a lot of outdoor activities. And uh, we also like to collaborate with uh, schools in developing uh, memory and readdressing issues of memory. We had an exhibition uh, about um, memorial spaces in, in Europe. You may see some of your own uh, famous monuments from your own countries presented in this uh, exhibition. And we also like to combine uh, these activities together with the uh, academic knowledge. So the focus is to readdress memory in space and to make people, especially the young, understand that memory is not something lost in books, but is present in the space. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Perfect timing, even like less than 90 seconds. Yeah, very impressive. And now I would like to uh, invite Ms. Uh, Olga Kotwik from the Ukrainian National Center for Peace Building. So now I'm representing Ukrainian voice and Ukrainian governmental institution, uh, Ukrainian Center for Peace Building. I guess I had a presentation, but, or maybe that's just one slide. It's very simple with it. Great. Uh, the website of the, um, our institution could be easily find it in the internet. So actually it's very challenging time to talk about peace building in Ukraine, but the institution was established um, uh, last year before the full-fledged invasion uh, to institutionalize all the peace building grassroots efforts um, that existed in Ukraine after 2014. So the very uh, powerful and united uh, network of dialogue facilitators and mediators and uh, grassroots peace building existed in Ukraine and um, the Ukrainian National Center was aimed to organize and coordinate these uh, efforts and give voices and leadership to Ukrainian-led peace building. Of course, with the full-fledged invasion, um, our responsibilities changed and we were involved and now involved in the emergency response and actually now we aim to coordinate state efforts on exchange, uh, identifying uh, prisoners of war and um, civilians in captivity. But I will address the bigger uh, strategic goal just to mention it, that uh, Ukrainian state is already thinking about the prospects of reconciliation and we are trying to think what will happen after the ceasefire or some kind of peace agreement will uh, happen. And there are a lot of challenges apart from a regime change in Russia, but also uh, the 
collective responsibility of Russians and the great challenge is that Ukrainians are really facing problems to re-establish the connections even with relatives on the Russian side because of tremendous impact of propaganda and that's what we should work on. I'm really sorry for, for taking too much time. So willing to collaborate, it would be a pleasure to meet you afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And as our next presenter, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Paweł Maliszewski from the Treblinka Museum, the Nazi German extermination and forced labor camp. In 1942, uh, German Nazis uh, established uh, Treblinka to death camp. Um, it was the last camp established as, as a part of Operation Reinhardt, as a part of so-called final solution of the Jewish question. Uh, it is estimated that from 800,000 to 900,000 Jews were murdered there in gas chambers, uh, mainly from Poland. Uh, two kilometers from uh, Treblinka 2, Treblinka 1, penal labor camp had been already existed that operated from the late summer of 1941 to the end of July 1944. Uh, it is estimated that uh, 20,000 Poles, Jews, and Romanis went through this camp, um, and half of them died because of exhaustion, diseases, or were murdered. Um, Museum complex also includes Black Road that connected both camps, uh, Gravel Pit, a place of slave labor, and the execution site, five kilometers from mentioned places. There is a commemoration of Treblinka train station. Um, in addition to standard ed educational activities, the museum offers many new ed educational formats um, that connect people. One of them is the Korczak Forest, where schools and institutions from Poland and abroad can plant a tree with a common purpose to, to commemorate Janusz Korczak, all those who cooperated with him, and above all, the children who lost their lives in the Treblinka II death camp. In 2023, the construction of new museum building um, um, will be built on the premises of the Treblinka Museum. Uh, we believe that the building will facilitate the reconciliation between the nations. Thank you. I hope, yeah, okay, my mic works. I would like to invite Mr. Um, Juraj Maruszak from the, Maruszak, okay, excuse me, from the Slovak Academy of Science. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, firstly, I would like to express my thanks to uh, the organizers for inviting me uh, to uh, the conference. Uh, I would uh, rather focus on the presentation of uh, our institute than on the presentation of some uh, particular uh, projects or results of the project. So our institute has been established in 1990 as uh, it's uh, like a relatively new institu uh, in institution within the framework of academy. Uh, and um, uh, so the uh, issue uh, of the uh, past, uh, the Slovak debate on, of the past is uh, already more than 10 years. One of the uh, key topics of the research of our institute, especially the heritage of uh, totalitarian non-democratic regimes. However, we switched from this uh, policy of the uh, coming to terms with the past to the um, uh, more uh, 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 contemporary, more, uh, less ideologically uh, topic uh, of the policy of the past. So, however, we also switched from uh, this uh, domestic debate also to the role of the past in the foreign policy of Slovak Republic and how much the, uh, in which extent the uh, heritage of the uh, of the past, uh, not only of the Second World War, but also heritage, of, for example, of Magyarization, heritage of uh, communism can uh, uh, give an impact on uh, the relations within the Visegrad group countries. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. And as a next person, I would like to invite Ms. Shinet McCall from the you know, Department of Tourist, Culture, Arts, Gweiltat, Sports and Media. Sorry, it was the Irish word I couldn't pronounce correctly. 
Okay, thanks very much. Cade uh, Mila Falta, Gakdina. Uh, welcome, um, everyone. Um, I am one of the Irish speakers I'm going to be speaking tomorrow, but um, more generally. So I decided that I would introduce you to the project. And there is a film that's going to play behind me. Hopefully, um, yeah. it can start, but I'll, I'll continue on anyway. So Manal100.ie is an initiative of the Decade of the Centenaries, the government's commemoration program. The role of Manal 100, which means women 100, documents women's role in our revolutionary period. Um, the decade of centenaries lasted um, from uh, 1912 to 1923, and we're commemorating that now, and we're coming to the very end of our, um, this decade of centenaries. Um, one of the great legacies of the decade of centenaries is a richer understanding and appreciation of the role that women played in shaping our journey towards independence and self-determination. We have navigated our way through the most complex and sensitive period of commemoration, which now includes not only the partition of our country, but also now the civil war and the foundation of the Irish Free State. The Minister, um, Catherine Martin, who is head of the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media, um, has, has focused and wanted to ensure that this important work continues. Her objective is to highlight the experience and influence of women who lived during this period of immense change, some of whom are well known to Irish people and, and um, others who are not. They contrib contributed significantly to Irish political life and public service, the voices of, of those who have never been heard before, and it's based on original and new scholarship. Um, we also acknowledge the, the, the role of, of the suffering that women had and also the violence at this period and that's also something that we're going to be looking at in the coming months. Uh, the state's role is to set a measured, inclusive and insensitive tone and I'm the historian in the commemorations unit and the curator of Noah 100 leading on this, on this particular initiative. Um, so the new, new research scholarship and working with our national cultural institutions, our local authorities network, um, it's a collaborative um, uh, effort. And I'm sorry that you're not going to see the film because it showed the type of work that we did. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And as a next person, I would like to invite Ms. Chiara Nencioni from the Ministry of Education from Italy. So, okay. Hi to everybody, I'm Chiara Mencioni. I am an Italian researcher, and my talk is about uh, reconciliation among Italy, Croatia, and Slovenia. Starting from the fascist and anti-Slovenian politics, the forced nationalization of slave minorities, and the brutal Italian occupation, arriving to Foibe, killing of thousand Italians by Slav partisans, I focus on the relationship between Italian and Slovenian governments that stepped forward on 13 July 2020 when the President Mattarella and the President Pahor met in Trieste and visited Basovica Foibe and Slovenian War Memorial. Then, Mattarella returned to Slovenian community Narodni Dom, exactly 100 years after of the fire started by fascists, which destroyed it. According to, the, to this project, University of Trieste and the National Institute of uh, Ferruccio Parri, for which I work for, that is the network of 66 institutes for contemporary history and the resistance, organized the virtual exhibition put on fire and sword, Italian occupation of Yugoslavia. The next step in the project will be um, yeah, will be uh, about a genocide with a special focus on uh, Srebrenica in collaboration with uh, the association Srebrenica City of Hope. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, as, and as the next person, I would like to invite Ms. Catherine Olun from the Wolf Institute, uh, Cambridge. Do we have Ms. Olun with us? Okay, it's a pity. So I think we should um, invite the next person, which would be Mr. Albert Stankowski from the Warsaw Ghetto Museum. Oh, is he missing as well? <laughs> oh, that's a disappointment. Okay, so now um, we'll present a short um, yeah, presentation movie about the Cultura Paresca. I think that's, that's um, next thing on our schedule, to our surprise. And yeah. We don't see it. The Enterprise begins in 1946 when a few soldiers from the Anders Army, refusing to accept the reality imposed on Poland by communist rule, decide to stay in exile and carry on the fight with the only weapon at their disposal, the written word. They create the literary institute, popularly known as Cultura Paresca, for over over half a century, they live and work in Maison Lafitte near Paris. They publish the Cultura monthly and the Zeszyty Historyczne Historical Quarterly. They support the anti-communist opposition in Poland and Eastern Europe, establish contacts with democratic intellectuals from other countries, and monitor and report on what is happening behind the Iron Cart. After the fall of the Iron Curtain and the deaths of the founders of the original Literary Institute, we now work to secure and promote their legacy, principally by preserving a rich archive devoted to the history of 20th century Europe, already the source of many important studies. Uh, Gedroich was always interested not just in the affairs of today's Poland, but the relations between Poland and Ukraine, Poland and Lithuania, Poland and Belarus, Poland and Russia. In other words, he had a vision of historic Poland. The vision is still alive and uh, relevant today. Okay, I think this was the last scene, so thank you very much for this short movie. And now, I'm not sure if we have Dominic Kretschmann with us from the Krzyżowa Foundation for Mutual Understanding of Europe, because he mentioned that he might come a little bit late, and I think he's still on his way. So, <laughs> this was the, the, he was supposed to be the last uh, of our guests for tonight. So I just introduce my colleague Antoni, who will inform you about the further steps of our symposium. So, thank you very much. Okay, so the upcoming schedule is that we uh, will meet in, in five minutes uh, next to the registration boxes, and we'll head uh, by buses to uh, see the, um, uh, the exhibition that we, our exhibition, which is called After the Great War, and it is uh, presented in...